I do not want any of this crap at the end of this book because it is absolutely vile and disgusting and I don't like it and I'm definitely not reading any more from this author so <sighs> Let me start off this vlog by saying I am not the target audience for this book series. It may come as a shock to you that I am not a teenage girl. But if the movies told me anything, it's that anybody can be a princess. And God damn it, I want to be a princess. And I know Emma from Drinking By My Shelf did this vlog like four years ago now. And you might be thinking, Gavin, you're a bit late to the party. Well, to that I say a queen is never late. Everyone else is simply early. The Princess Diaries book series began in the year 2000. I was seven, going on eight. What? <laughs> and here I am, a 31-year-old man, reading books that are evidently not targeted towards me. But just to give you a bit more background as well, the first 10 books in the Princess Diary series came out between the year 2000 and 2009. So these are the original 10. And then two additional books came out in 2015 and 2023. So the 12 books that I'm reading in this video and the complete Princess Diary series are the Princess Diaries, Take Two, Third Time Lucky, Mia Goes Forth, Give Me Five, Sixational, Seventh Heaven, After Eight, To the Nines, Ten Out of Ten, The Princess Diaries Wedding, and The Quarantine Princess Diaries. I will also do a movie marathon of the first and second Princess Diaries movies with my patrons sometime in February, which I'm very, very excited about. I love these movies so, so much. Anne Hathaway, Julie Andrews, they are just perfect, absolutely perfect in these movies. So I'm really looking forward to rewatching these also in this vlog. Okay, so there's so much that I need to preface this with saying is that, you know, I'm gonna read these books, right? And I'm gonna give my peer thoughts on them, unfiltered, honest, all of these things as a modern day reader who is also 31 year old man. So I'm gonna try and give this series as much grace as possible. And I'm gonna start this off by saying I did like this. I thought this was pretty good, but I will point out when this book does something that I find wrong or problematic or just something that hasn't aged well because I feel like it's important to be able to still say what those things are and inform everyone who's about to read these books or is about to recommend these books to a younger audience you know that they know all of this too so don't feel like I'm just going to be tearing apart these books because I'm really not I'm just going to mention when something doesn't work and I'm gonna mention when things do work. I already don't love this as much as I do the movies, and I guess that is just gonna be something that will forever be a bias because I did grow up watching the movies, I love the movies so much, so obviously the books were never gonna really compare to the movies for me personally. I'm sure there are so many people out there who maybe grew up on the books first and prefer the books over the movies, and that's absolutely valid. I, for instance, I don't like the characters really, or at least I start this book out by not really liking Mia and I'm gonna give her so much grace again because she is only 14 years old she is a teenager how many teenagers are actually that likable I mean at 14 I was not likable whatsoever I was going through something okay I was going through so much I mean I wasn't becoming a princess or anything like that so I've got to give it to Mia like she was going through it but you know like she is a little bit judgmental, she's very cynical, she really does tear apart people's appearances quite a bit, so it makes her less likeable as a character. But what I will say is though that even though I will be saying all these reasons why I don't like Mia and I don't like Clarice or like other characters, that I do think Mia in particular goes on a really good character journey, like a good character arc during this book, and I think we end this book in such a good place for Mia where there was character development, there was character growth. So let me vent a little bit about Mia before you start telling me, oh, but she's only 14, she's a teenager, like she's not, you know, I know, I know. But I do think she gets better as the book goes on. Also, I finished this book like 11 days ago. It's taken me this long to get back into talking about it. I do remember everything. I think this is like such a quick, easy, memorable book. I ended up reading this physically alongside the audiobook, which I had no idea was narrated by Anne freaking Hathaway. What? I think she narrated the first few 
Princess Diaries books, but I can only get the third one on audiobook by Anne Hathaway as well. But I thought, oh my gosh, like literally Mia from the movies is, you know, Mia in the books too. Like that, that was, it was so good. Like she was a really good audiobook narrator. I thought she really got the, the Mia voice obviously down, but I feel like the Mia character in the book differs quite a bit from the movie character, but I think Anne Hathaway did a good job at combining the two a little bit. And I guess making some of the things that Mia says a little bit more relatable in that way because you're hearing it, you know, actually being spoken out loud. And sometimes you can kind of feel those emotions a bit better than this kind of epistory novel format. Because yes, Mia ends up getting a diary from her mum and it's a way for her to be able to write down all of her feelings and her thoughts every single day, what she's going through as a teenager and all of the problems she faces, the crushes that she has, the family problems that she ends up having. All of that is like a really good way of uh, starting this book. And the entire book is just diary entries. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with that kind of format, but I think it does work here because you really do get the feeling that she is a genuine teenage girl and she talks about all of the teenage problems. Like for instance, there is a lot of focus on body image. Like she talks about her breasts quite a lot, which is like weird for me to read, obviously. But there were like kind of times where it felt, and I can't fault Mia for this because the pressures for young girls to feel like they have to have bigger chests or that they have to lose their virginity and stuff like that. Like the pressure is absolutely real. Like I'm not gonna fault this book for how often it brings that up because this genuinely feels like an account of a, a teenage girl. Like this could literally be real. But I do want people to know going into this, if you're gonna recommend this to a young teenage girl, that there are a lot of issues with body image. Hello Ash. No, that's Tobu. Oops, oh my God. I think that's like the first time I ever mixed up my cats. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I caught it on camera too. Uh, he left, he left. It's just something that is brought up quite a lot is like body image issues. Like the fact of Mia wanting bigger breasts. Like Mia is like measuring her chair. She's like calling herself names and like flat chested and stuff like that. And it's obviously kind of heartbreaking to see the self image issues that Mia has. Cause I just wanna be like, Mia, don't worry, you're fine. You'll get there, you know what I mean? It's like, I ended up feeling quite proud of Mia by the end of this book. And I obviously couldn't relate to a lot of the like female side of the, the problems of being a teenager, but like I could understand and I could sympathize. So I do think that boys can still read this, okay? I think I would have loved this if I was a young teen and I was like actually reading the books. And like even taking the movie out of it, I think I would have enjoyed these myself as a teenage boy. I feel like the story was pretty good. The characters get better. You know, it's like, anyone can read it. You don't have to be a girl to read The Princess Diaries. I just want that to be very, very clear. <laughs> if you're watching this and you have like a nephew or like a son and you want them to like read more, don't be put off by the fact that it does go through self-image issues for girls. In fact, it could make boys realize what girls go through, I think. So maybe it would be a good idea for more boys to read this, especially with Josh. Like Josh is, Lana's boyfriend, but he is somebody who Mia has this big crush on and he ends up being really mean to Mia and well, he ends up stringing her along because he finds out that she's a princess and so like he dumps Lana. He ends up taking uh, Mia to a party and kisses Mia in front of the paparazzi, which Mia didn't like, but Mia stands up for herself and she tells Josh that wasn't cool, like that wasn't a good thing to do. So I feel like the way that the girls of this story kind of put the boys in their place, I feel like this could be a good lesson for teenage boys who think they can do anything they want with a girl. But I genuinely, and this is a much bigger discussion for a Princess Diaries video, but we have a big problem with boys being raised into men who think they can do whatever they want with women. I feel like if you start younger teaching men to not be creeps, then hopefully it will stick with them in adulthood. And that way it's the men who have to learn to change, not women having to change themselves in order to feel safe. Like that is just silly to me. Like women shouldn't have to change anything. It's the men who need to change. So sorry, that was like a little bit of a tangent. I don't know how long this vlog's gonna end up being if I end up like having a tangent. So yeah, uh, Mia starts off quite unlikable. And I do think there are some outdated things that even Mia brings across that I think should be discussed. So for example, Mia says, I asked Lily why he was so mad, referring to Lily's brother, Michael. I asked Lily why he was so mad, and she said, because he'd been sexually harassing me, but I didn't notice. How embarrassing. Supposing Josh Richter starts sexually harassing me someday, I wish, and I don't notice. God, I'm so stupid sometimes. Like, stuff like that needs to be addressed, because that's Mia saying she wants to be sexually harassed by Josh, and, like, she didn't even realise that Michael 
Lily's brother was sexually harassing her. I just read that part and I was like, what in the world? What in the world? I can imagine there are like teenage girls who probably think that that's okay because of how society glorifies men over women. And I can totally see why a teenage girl would think sexual harassment is okay when it's not. So I feel like that's like really important to address. <gasps> and I was so shocked as well because I didn't realize that Mia's dad was still alive. Like I thought he was dead. I mean, he is in the movies, but like he's still alive. He is dead in the movies, isn't he? Oh my God, it's been so long since I watched the movies. I'm pretty sure he is. But yeah, he's still alive, but he does have testicular cancer. And another thing I didn't really like is how Mia, obviously like she's young and she doesn't really fully understand, but like how, like Mia and Lily, how they make it seem like really gross because they're talking about testicles. And like, I get it in a way because, you know, it's, it's the male anatomy and that would come across as gross. But me personally, I just like didn't really like the portrayal of someone with testicular cancer because of that. Unfortunately, the part they had to cut off was, ew, I don't even like writing it, his testicle gross. I guess in a way, like, yeah, I could totally say the teenage side of it. So like, that isn't really like too much of an issue. I do feel like the testicular cancer part of this wasn't really in the forefront, but it did mean that the revelation of uh, Mia being a princess had a bit more agency than in the the movies because now like she is the heir to the throne, which again, like, I don't understand like how she didn't really realize because she even says he's been pretty busy running Genovia. So like she knows about Genovia. She goes there every summer to see her grandmia, which is Clarice, and they go shopping and, and stuff like that. So she's been there like every summer. She knows her dad runs the country, but I guess she thinks he was like some kind of government official and that was that. But I'm like, how do you go to Genovia every single summer and nobody say that you're a princess or like that isn't even a thing. And it seems like the people of Genovia know that Mia is a princess and that she is uh, her dad, what? I can't even remember what her dad's called. I think she just calls him dad. Like she never really calls him by name, I don't think. They know that he has a child and they know that it's Mia. So like, how did nobody, you know, whenever they've gone shopping, I guess maybe it was explained that Clarice would make sure that these stores were closed to everyone else when they went. I'm just like, how did she not clock on? Like even just like not even going into the malls and stuff, but like going around Genovia. What about like the media? What about the paparazzi, you know? And I just like, how do you go about as a princess? I, I, I don't understand. <laughs> but I think what this book does much better than the films, because I think the films really glorifies being a princess and they make that whole princess lifestyle a lot more glamorous than what it looks like in the Princess Diaries books. And so Mia's struggle with coming to terms with being a princess comes across as more genuine in the books. It's something that I actually do prefer in here. Just the way they kind of spring it on her and they've kept it secret from her this entire time, which does, again, kind of come through on the movie. But this one, it seems less glamorous because they're saying, okay, Mia, now you have to move countries. You have to go to different schools. You have to be taken away from your friends. And it's the way that her dad's so forceful. Like Mia wants to go to Iceland to save the baby seals. And her dad says, you most certainly are not. You are going to college. Vasa, I think, maybe Sarah Lawrence. It's like the way that they're so forceful and like you have no choice. It's, you know, I was on Mia's side this entire time. And the way that they do try to change her pretty much straight away. And she even says, I am not happy. I'm not a bit happy. Grammy is happy. Grammy is head over heels happy about how I look because I don't look a thing like Mia Thermopolis. She's turning me into someone else. So I feel like those feelings of losing your identity, especially during a time in your life, you know, during puberty, during your teenage years, that is like so fundamental to try and retain something of yourself that you can claim your own, which is your identity. And if you start losing your identity at this age, it's very damn, like it can be so traumatizing. So it does come across so much better in the book. Clarice sounds like an absolute bitch. I'm not gonna lie, like she sounds awful. She does not sound like the Julie Andrews I know and love. Even Mia on page 20 was like, I was kind of hoping Grammy was dead but I knew it had to be much worse than that. <laughs> the fact that she wished her own grandmother was dead was like, okay. And the fact that Mia's dad is traumatized by the way that Clarice raised him, like apparently she would lock him up in a room when he wasn't behaving and stuff like that. I'm like, what? And also she's homophobic. Clarice is homophobic. Oh, also as well, I don't know if this is worse than being a homophobe, but she had eyeliner tattooed on her eyelids. I'm trying to visualize Clarice in 
the book. Like, she doesn't sound like a fashion icon like Julie Andrews. Like, but she has eyeliner tattooed on her face. But anyway, she's never been below 57th Street before. She's going to hate it here in the village. I'm telling you right now, people of the same sex kiss and hold hands in our neighborhood all the time. Gramia has a fit when she sees people of the opposite sex holding hands. What's she going to do during the gay pride parade when everyone is kissing and holding hands and shouting, we're here, we're queer, get over it. Gramia won't get over it. Like, she's, she's a homophobe. So if she sees two guys holding hands, she'll have a fit. I'm just like, Gramia? I also kind of wish she was dead. And she also calls Princess Diana a twink. I'm like, what? Like, I need to look this up because surely that's not what I'm thinking it means. What did twink mean in the 90s? Twink was beginning to replace chicken to describe a young, attractive gay man. Wait, so did it mean chicken? Oh, mm. well, no, by the 1990s and 2000s, twink had become a slang term used to refer to skinny, young, usually white gay men. Even in the 1960s, it was referred to as like homosexual prostitute. Another possible origin, American snack cake Twinkie, currently regarded as a quintessential junk food, little nutritional value, sweet to the taste and cream filled. Wait, so Clarice was calling Princess Diana cream filled? Anyway, actually the amount of times Princess Diana has mentioned this, it was funny as well because there were some differences between the audiobook and the physical copy. So there was a, a, a part of this when, you know, Princess Mia has been outed by the press and they're flocking the school. And there are some students, they're shouting out the window in the book, go find some real news and hey, take a picture of this, accompanied by a rude gesture. But in the audiobook, it's changed to, you kill Diana, you kill Princess Diana. They were shouting this to the media. I'm like, damn, like they changed that? They changed it for like this edition. I don't know what these editions are. Okay, this edition published in 2015. So I think maybe, they've changed some things. Although if they're gonna change that, they should change the use of the R word because the R word was used in this. And they should also change the fact that Mia didn't care about racism for a bit of this too. So Lily is trying to boycott this place called, I can't remember what it was called, but Lily wants to boycott it because there is like this racist uh, atmosphere, this racist environment there. And there was like a moment when Mia like refused to sign the petition because she wasn't speaking to Lily, which again, like she's a teenager, she's being very petty, but it's when she's talking to Michael as well, over DMs, uh, well not DMs, like emails, which was cute. Like I, I love the whole uh, email exchange sections of this between Mia and Michael. Mia says something about like, or Michael asked, what do you think of the boycott? And Mia and Michael agreed that it was stupid. However, I do think she finally realizes that racism is bad because uh, when Lily on her TV show, Lily tells it like it is, this was the episode dedicated to exposing the unjust racism at Hall's Deli. At the end, Lily came on and did a segment she must have shot the night before with a tripod in her bedroom. She sat on her bed and said that racism is a powerful force of evil that all of us must work to combat. I love the fact that this book really does hammer that point home. And it does seem like Mia begins to realize the gravity of that situation. They do start to finally become friends a little bit too. Mia, she starts off not being very nice. Her dad gives her some money to give to the washroom attendant. Mia says, of course I put that in my pocket. Five bucks for the washroom attendant? Jeez, my whole allowance is 10 bucks a week. And then she ends the chapter by saying, I'm gonna give the washroom attendant a dollar, even though she didn't attend me. So Mia's development does come in quite nicely. And you know, her dad, no, sorry, her mum is dating the algebra teacher. And she starts off the book by calling him all of these names and seeing he's got like big nostrils and like being really judgmental. And then she finally says, the good sides of him. And she says, I guess I can sort of see how my mum likes Mr. J. He's okay to hang out with. And you know, like, it's not much. It's n it's really not much, but it's like, it's progress. It's her kind of, you know, putting her mum's feelings above her own. Because yeah, it is a bit weird, her mum dating her teacher, but like she starts to become like a little bit less self-absorbed, a little bit less selfish by the end of this book. I hope we go into the second book with this development too. I hope she does keep going back on herself. And I feel like her whole, princess revelation and her struggling with that really helped with that because even just before that bitch she was shouting at her grammy i do not want to be on the cover of vogue don't you understand i just want to pass ninth grade she just wants to be a, a kid like she just wants to do the things that the kids that she is surrounded by does as well you know like she just wants to be a kid so i think her development really ties in nicely with her rejection 
and final acceptance of her being a princess, which lends into her relying on her grandmother, like Clarice, and being a lot more talkative with her because, yeah, she was very standoffish with her at first. But then Mia starts to go to Clarice with her boy problems with, like, Josh and, like, how much she has a big crush on Josh. And then very at the end of the book, she ends up taking her grandmother to the loft to see the, the skyline of the city, which is actually kind of weird in the audiobook because the last two pages of the physical book were cut out of the audiobook. We actually end the audiobook very abruptly. Music starts playing very loudly. It actually gave me a jump scare. And it ends when this blind guy sexually harasses Clarice and Mia is laughing. And that's kind of how the audiobook ends. But then the book ends with her grandmother, her mum, her dad, all going to the loft and seeing like the skyline and Mia saying, for now, I guess I'll settle for what I've got because it's actually a lot now that I think about it. So like we end this book with her being appreciative of what she has and the journey she's gone on. So Mia, she does have a character arc, I like her. Michael, like, I'm not 100% sure like how to feel about this whole thing. It, it is sweet, the interactions and stuff they have, but then I have to remember that Michael is the same age as Josh and Josh is 18, Mia is 14. So that to me, isn't what I want to read about. It isn't. And I know things were different about 20 years ago. And now to this day, like a four year age difference doesn't really mean anything when it's like a 32 year old and a 36 year old or something like that when they're adults. But an 18 year old and a 14 year old, that makes me feel pretty icky. Well, I'm trying to either age Mia up or Michael down in order for me to see any kind of romance between them and not think it's creepy. You know, it's like, I'm trying so hard to get out my modern sensibilities. I like the fact that Mia realized that Josh wasn't good for her. I loved when she shouted at him and she stood up for herself. The press pressure them to kiss, although Josh is the one who got the press there. Josh is the one who kisses her and Mia felt embarrassed. And then she says to uh, Josh, why did you do that? And he says, do what? And she said, kiss me like that in front of everybody. And he said, didn't you hear them? They were yelling at me to kiss you. So I did, why? And she says, I didn't appreciate it. <laughs> Mia, yes. You didn't appreciate it, Josh looked confused. You mean you didn't like it? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. Like how direct Mia is. And like she was so nervous about this because she had the biggest crush on Josh. And Tobu is like literally, Tobu, do I say hello? Ah! <laughs> yes, Tofu! Yes, Tofu! Hi, Tofu! I got you. Why are you being annoying for? I'm just trying to do me vlog update. Mm, oh, you're so cute. You're such a cutie pie. Mm. <laughs> the fact that Mia says all of this to the person she's had the biggest crush on this entire book, which was, again, like, so relatable. Like, I can relate to having the biggest crush on someone and feeling like it wasn't reciprocated. Like, oh my god, I could write a book myself about that. But to actually stand up to the person you thought you loved, and as a teenager too, I was wigless at this point. I was so proud of Mia and how direct she was. Like she wasn't even just like timid and like, I'm sorry, like, I, I didn't like it. Like, can we like not? And then like, she didn't let Josh control the narrative there. She took control. And she even said to him, you just wanna get your picture on extra. I turned my back on him and walked out. <laughs> well, thank you, Josh, but I can get my own publicity. I don't need you. Oh. <laughs> and I feel bad that this was her first kiss ever. Now it's associated with like bad memories. But like, I, I honestly, I, oh, Mia was so good at the end of the year. And also Lily, like she ends up sticking up for Mia too, which was great, honestly great. Also, I need to mention someone called Tina. Mia has a friend called Tina Hakeem Barber. And there was a moment in this when Mia sticks up for Tina and puts an ice cream cone on Lana, which I believe does happen in the movies, but I think it's where Mia stands up for herself, not for someone else. So I kind of prefer the fact that Mia stood up for someone else at this point in the book before she stands up for herself at the end. It's like she's slowly starting to get more confident and she's starting to feel a lot more of her self-worth. So yeah, I, I again, I really enjoyed her progression. And Lily, I prefer Tina over Lily, let's just say that. Lily is, yeah. she does also have some development, I will give her that. They do fall out because Lily doesn't like the new hair. She feels like her friend is turning into Lorna, which again, like she's a teenager too. I understand if you think you're losing your best friend and you think that she is gonna go on the side of the bullies kind of thing. I can totally understand and relate to that. Lily is actually speaking to me again, not criticizing me or complaining about my behavior. She's actually speaking to me in a friendly manner. 
She's gonna make a concerted effort to stop telling everyone, especially me, what to do. All up to your mistakes, Lily. I love that. She apologized, she admitted she was wrong, and they're moving forward as best friends. Like, you can't hold this over Lily's head the entire time. So I do hope she gets better and she learns that lesson too in the future books. I really couldn't stand Lily in the movies. Like, I used to think they had a good friendship when I was younger, but oh my god, I think I rewatched The Princess Diaries like 10, 12 years ago, and I was shocked by Lily. I was like, I genuinely thought she was a good friend when I was, I, no, like, she really is, like, she is like one of the worst. She's one of the worst friends I've ever seen depicted. But in the book, she isn't really that much better. She does make a lot of mistakes, but I feel like you kind of understand a little bit more where Lily comes from in the books. However, Lily does go a bit overboard with criticizing Mia's looks. Like that is never acceptable, that's never okay. So yeah, that was not good, that was not cool Lily. But she does, again, own up to her mistakes and she learns from it. So we're gonna say if she sticks to that lesson. Oh my god, there was a perfect teacher as well who is like feeling up the students. I know you should never go near Mrs. Stewart's desk because if you do, he'll reach out and rub your shoulders. Like he's giving you a massage, but everyone says he's really just trying to see whether or not you're wearing a bra. Like that is really creepy. I hope he is like jailed or something in the future. I hope it wasn't just like some kind of throwaway line from Mia, I hope something's done about that because that was not cool. But story-wise itself, really did enjoy Mia doing like princess lessons with her grandma, them getting closer, and Mia's development by the end. Like I was expecting this to be terrible. Not exactly terrible, terrible, because I do know this is beloved, but I didn't think I would like it as much as I did. This pleasantly surprised me. I think going in with like lower expectations really helped with this. And again, there are still some things that I'm, I'm unsure about. And going forward, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to overlook Michael and Mia's age difference and that kind of thing. But I'm gonna try my best to not be too critical and just to tell it like it is, like Lily. This is Gavin tells it like it is now, okay? I would give this a three star. It wasn't exactly high literature or anything like that, and it doesn't need to be, but I think it had enough fun that it's still kind of relevant today to the age demographic. And I think it, it still had an entertaining storyline. So yay, we're starting off pretty good. If Mia and her friends say self-actualization one more time, I'm gonna hurl these out the window. I finished the next two Princess Diaries books. I'm definitely taking my time with these a little bit more now. I feel like that's the best way of approaching these. I will say though, there are things that I enjoy about these books, don't get me wrong. There's, again, like so much that I don't love and I want to talk about it in a way that it's kind of like gossip, you know, like we're just gossiping about it rather than me criticizing it too much. So I hope that's the way it comes across as because yeah, there are just things that I'm like, okay, we need to talk about this. <laughs> so book two had a lot going for it, especially in terms of like Mia's personal life, especially with her family. So like for that reason, I think I would probably give this maybe like a 2.5 stars. Cause I feel like the way Mia handles some of the personal situations, especially when it has to do with her mum being pregnant, her mum gets pregnant with her algebra teacher and they're about to get married too. So this is what this book is kind of about. And you see Mia in a sort of different light because of that. Mia is actually like quite a good daughter for some of this. So when her mum is in tears, Mia says, it's okay, mom, you'll always have me. I'll help with everything. The midnight feeds, the diaper changing, everything, even if it turns out to be a boy. And you can say Mia is a 14 year old, you know, really actually being a bit more mature. And then this is the thing though, because a lot of the times Mia comes across as mature, you know, she has these really good ideals with like wanting to protect the environment and save the world and all of this. And then there are other times when she is just downright dislikable in the way that she criticizes so many people and pulls apart their appearance. And then she herself is upset when people do the same back to her, you know what I mean? It's like, she can be very hypocritical about what's going on around her. Like it's okay for her to judge others, but not when they judge her kind of thing. So I, I don't like the fact that Mia gets bullied. I don't like the fact that Mia is so self-conscious about the way she looks and things. But then the other side of that, it's like Mia does the exact same thing to other people. So like we do have these bullies that bully Mia, but in a sense, Mia is also a bully to other people and even to her own friends. For instance, where Mia has to do like this primetime interview and she says a little bit more than she should have. So like she does accidentally reveal that her mum is pregnant 
and her dad and Clarice and everyone didn't know about that, so she did accidentally reveal that. That's neither here nor there in my eyes. But the thing that Mia does that is like so mean, and it's to her friend Tina, and Tina is probably like the only genuinely nice character in this series. Like, I really do like Tina, but at the same time, I'm like, Tina, you deserve better. I kind of want you to not be friends with Mia in that group because they are kind of toxic. So Mia says on this broadcast that gets 22 million viewers, when Mia's asked what she thought and like how she felt when she found out she was a princess, she says, all I could think was that I was going to die if people in school found out because I don't want to end up being a freak like my friend Tina who has to go around school with a bodyguard. But that's exactly what happened. I am a freak, a huge freak. And the fact that Tina is literally the only person who is genuinely nice to Mia, like no strings attached. Everyone else usually does stuff that you have to question like, are you genuinely friends? <laughs> Especially Lily, like come on, Lily's the worst. But with Tina, and Tina doesn't even say it that way, Tina's actually so happy that Mia even mentioned her in the interview. And even Tina's family are like happy that Tina got mentioned and it's just like, oh Tina, you poor innocent being. She literally just called you a freak on television in front of 22 million people. Leave her, leave her, please. And on the other side of this as well is there is a certain relatability to Mia being this all-American princess. And later on, we have Lily filming Mia without Mia's knowledge or consent. There's two sides to this. The side is that Mia comes across as really relatable because Mia is talking unfiltered. She isn't feeling anxious about talking publicly because she doesn't know she's talking publicly right then. Mia does mention like how she wants to like save the world and she wants to protect animals and get all of the homeless animals to Genovia and look after them so that no animal ever gets put down because they don't have a home kind of thing. Like all of that makes Mia so relatable and such a nice lovely person. And then yeah, it just like she keeps bouncing between being nice and being downright nasty. And even in this one, Principal Gupta even says to Mia at one point, I feel like Lily is a bad influence on you. Yeah, your friendship with Lily Moscovitz, and I sometimes wonder if she might not be, well, a negative influence on you. I mean, yes, but also no, because Lily is also someone who you despise as a friend, but Lily as a person sometimes comes across as so nice. And like, she does do really good things, especially with her TV show, where she platforms trying to take down racism, ableism, you know, things that, are genuine evils in the world, Lily, as a 14-year-old, is actually trying to combat that with her TV show. That is like a great thing. That's an amazing thing. But then Lily is also just a nasty person outside of those things. And even Mia knows this. Like she says, Lily's show is actually quite positive. Didn't you see the episode dedicated to fighting racism in Korean delis? Or the one about how a lot of clothing stores that cater for teens are prejudiced against larger sized girls? Yeah, like some genuine concerns are raised that I think really do speak to the society of like how it oppresses like a lot of teenage girls as well. You do see a lot of things that has affected teenage girls and the way they see themselves. And I think it's like such an important thing to tackle. So for instance, like one thing I really do blame the media for, and not exactly teenagers for, because they consume media, they think they know things based off what they're told. So like for instance, Lily Moscovitz and Mia Thermopolis's list of celebrities and their breasts. So I feel like the obsession with bodies and the way that these girls look is because of the way media portrays female celebrities. We have a list of female celebrities here, like Britney Spears, Lindsay Lohan, Angelina Jolie, Gwen Stefani, etc. And Lily and Mia have done, like, whether or not they think their breasts are real or fake. That's really objectifying and that is also really harmful for girls and women to perceive themselves as in like their self-worth is relying on their breast size and I feel like especially with like Mia's obsession with how she looks and the way that she's like measuring her chest a lot is because of the media is because you know especially in the early 2000s too you would have an image of I don't know like Britney Spears for example and the media would say Britney Spears is now fat or things like that, you know, like things that were really damaging and harmful when obviously that wasn't the case. It was just the way that the media portrayed celebrities a lot of the time. And obviously like teenagers, not just girls, but boys too, feeling influenced by that. So I feel like there's so much harmful stuff in here that I don't know if whether or not Meg, the author, is portraying it very well because I don't think she 
combats that. She doesn't really challenge it. I feel like 90% of the time, Mia says something or Lily says something or does something that's kind of problematic. It's usually due to the fact that we have uh, a society in place where teenagers feel pressured into thinking and acting a certain way. But nine times out of 10, that's not challenged. Nine times out of 10, they just continue going on with doing their thing. And these lessons are kind of brushed under the rug. Sometimes they are challenged. Like when Mia says, imitating Asian people isn't right. And yes, absolutely. But then there is also another time when Mia says, oh, being Asian is fashionable. And I'm like, sometimes we make progress and then sometimes we take a couple of steps back. Also, we have a poem that Mia writes where she is looking outside the window. I don't know why this is included. Like, I understand that Mia is writing down what she is saying, but I'm, I'm just gonna show you exactly what she writes because I'm not gonna say it out loud. Oh, you know what I've highlighted there? I know this is a poem that's an ode to the view from the window in my algebra class. It was just such a surprise to turn the page and read that sentence. I'm like, in a teen book? Really, is that what we have to like, say right now and the fact that like it's mentioned once and like never mentioned again as well it's like no that's bad like don't want to do that i know i'm probably reading too much into that but it is just such a surprise to see that line come out of nowhere yeah as i mentioned with like mia's personal life her mum is getting married but i don't understand why because mia's mum doesn't want to get married in this really fancy way in which clarice is trying to force her like she's trying to make this like a big massive wedding uh and mia's mum doesn't want that and neither does Mia, and Mia enlists the help of her dad to stop this wedding from being too grand and too extravagant. So on the day of the wedding, Mia wakes up and her mum isn't there, and her dad says, oh, he has a letter from your mum, you have to open it at 8pm, which is the time the wedding starts. I'm like, who the fuck starts a wedding at 8pm, for one? And two, why is there a, a random letter from her mother? Why doesn't her mother just tell her what's going on? So the, everything where the wedding is happening, all of the people are, have turned up the wedding guests, including Donald fucking Trump, Hillary Clinton, Catherine Zeta-Jones, the Duchess of York, you know, there's like quite a few celebrities there. Oh, Phil Collins is also playing piano. And like everyone's here. And then 8 p.m. happens, no sign of the bride and groom. And then Mia opens this letter and Mia's mum says, oh, me and Mr. Giannani uh, have gone abroad to get married. We're not getting married today. And I'm like, and that was because they didn't want to tell Clarice because Clarice would have stopped them. However, why the hell didn't they just get on the plane and tell them, as they were getting on the plane, oh, the wedding's not happening today, we're not coming, rather than wait until absolutely everybody had had arrived. Like, do you think Catherine Cita Jones has, like, an afternoon free just to come to a wedding that's not gonna happen? Like, I don't understand the logic behind that, and Mia herself, too. Like, they didn't even tell Mia, and the fact that Mia is their daughter, well, Mia's mum's daughter, not Mr. Giannani's daughter, but, like, they're pregnant, they're having a new baby, they're getting married without Mia being there or even telling her what their plan was. And they said, oh, we didn't want to tell you, Mia, because if Clarice asks you about it, at least you genuinely do not know. But I'm like, but why can't you just do that as you got on the plane? And then at least the entire day, none of that would have went to waste. People's time wouldn't have been wasted. And I'm just like, why didn't you take your own daughter to witness the marriage? Why are you going abroad? without telling your daughter anything. The daughter who lives with you, who is 14 years old, what is wrong with you? You know what I mean? It's like that whole thing was just so bizarre. Why the dramatics? Why? And then Clarice is holed up in the bathroom, crying her eyes out, being angry about the whole thing. I'm like, Clarice, why do you care? Like, Clarice doesn't even really like me as mum. Why does she care so much? I mean, I guess it was like a reflection of her. But like, Clarice, why was she even that obsessed with arranging this wedding anyway? Like, so many things with characters are just not really explained. Some of their actions are so contradictory to how they come across as. Clarice is still awful, like she's not a nice person. And there are moments when she is like a good grandmother to Mia, but she is just a confusing person to even follow. And Mia as well, because she can be so nice at some times and so nasty in other times. So another storyline is the fact that Mia is starting to get love letters. Okay, she's starting to get love letters from a secret admirer and she hopes that it's Michael because she loves Michael. She's obsessed with Michael. And I'm going to talk more about the whole Michael and Mia relationship and the age gap between them and the fact that Mia is a minor and Michael is not. I'm going to talk about that at the end of book three. 
So stick around for that. But in this one, Mia is just absolutely obsessed with the idea that Michael is the one who's sending him. Well, first it starts with an anonymous letter and then it goes into emails from someone called Joe C. Rocks. And Mia, yeah, she's just theorizing that it's Michael. Turns out it's Kenny. Someone called Kenny, who we meet in this book. It's just a, a student who is Mia's age. Mia says that he is good looking and, you know, he is a nice person. There's nothing really wrong with Kenny, but she doesn't want it to be Kenny. She wants it to be Michael. Even despite all of this, Mia does end up saying that she will go out with him at the very end, which does add some drama. It's like, oh, okay. Like she's going out with someone she doesn't love. Like that could be interesting. And I honestly relate to when I was in school, I was pressured by my friends to ask a girl out and I come on me asking a girl out like be serious some of my friends had pressured me into doing that and then I asked her out and then the next day I was like you know what like I, I didn't string her along I literally the next day I was like that was a mistake like I'm so sorry I was like pressured to ask you out I didn't mean it I'm so sorry and stuff and like we were still friends like after it and stuff but like I understand the pressures of doing that in not wanting to hurt someone's feelings. So like, I totally understand where Mia's coming from. And I'm gonna talk more about that in book three too, because the story does develop a bit more in book three. But yeah, the whole secret of Mayor thing was like kind of interesting. It added a little bit more mystery to the plot. So I kind of liked it. Lily is weird in this book too, because she also shames Mia for being the only person who hasn't French kissed a boy. So it turns out that Shamika, who is another one of their friends, Tina, Ling Su, and Lily have all had boys' tongues in their mouths, all of them, except for Mia. And like, again, like, I feel like maybe the media is to blame, but, like, Lily does kind of berate Mia for not having kissed a boy before. Since I've never French kissed and had nothing good to confess on the show, Lily decided to punish me by giving me a dare. So, Lily dares her to throw, was it, like, an aubergine? I think it was an aubergine. Oh, an eggplant, sorry, an eggplant. Which, are they the same thing? I actually don't know. <laughs> she dares Mia to throw an eggplant out the window, which is dangerous, it is very dangerous, and Mia being a princess, if anyone found out about that, that could show her to be very naughty. Michael even says, I'm serious, if anyone saw Mia do that just now, she could be arrested. Lily says, no, she couldn't, she's a minor. So like, Michael knows she's a minor. Anyway, she could still go to juvenile court. You better not be planning on airing that footage on your show. So yeah, Lily does like film it all and stuff. And while Lily doesn't show Mia's face when that happens, we do get that whole part where Mia doesn't know she's being filmed and she's talking about like how she wants to protect animals and stuff like that. That part was nice. Still weird that she didn't tell Mia that she was doing it, but like still. So that's a strike against Lily for berating her for not having ever kissed a boy before. So another moment of Lily being a bitch is... <laughs> When Mia does her interview uh, that's broadcast to like 22 million people, Lily is also angry with her because apparently Mia gave Lily exclusive rights, exclusive first rights to interview her, which I think is a plot point or something in the first movie. Or at least I think Mia said she would do an interview with Lily for her show, but then doesn't show up or something like that. Honestly, I don't know why. I grew up with those movies and it's been so long since I watched them. Memories of them are faded. I don't even know Michael's age in the movie, so I'm like, oh god. Mia says, I have no memory of this, but I guess it must be true. Like, the way that Lily gaslights and manipulates Mia, like, oh yeah, so Lily says this whole must be true. I'm like, Mia, wake up. A positive thing with Lily in this book is that when Mia's cousin Hank comes, and Hank is apparently really good looking. There's a really weird moment as well when, cause Hank has to accompany Mia at school and just like hang out with her at school. Like they let him in the school a student who doesn't go to that school in the classes and stuff, which I found weird. But yeah, they let him shadow Mia the entire day. And in one of the classes, I think it was like a hall pass he needed. So he asked the teacher for a hall pass and the teacher acts all giggly and flirty with this potentially 14 year old. I don't actually know how old he is. Hopefully he is the same age as all students. Because if he's an older student and they're again letting 18 year old students in the same class as a 14 year old I just feel like a lot of it's quite messy. But like the fact that a teacher has been all giggly with a student who is apparently very young, again, what is with these teachers? In the first book, there was a teacher who was massaging the shoulders or like trying to look down the young girl's bras and stuff. I'm like, why are these teachers, why are these teachers, you know? That was weird. But Lily does help Hank with his self-esteem because Hank wants to be a model, like an underwear model. Which again, you know, considering how young he is, I'm like, what? But anyway, let's ignore that for a second. Lily gives him self-esteem. So Hank says his family never wanted him to be a model. He said he could never make it. But Hank does end up becoming a Calvin Klein underwear model. And that was because of the help of Lily. And again, like, I don't understand. Lily, of all people, 
helped him with self-esteem, the person who brings down everyone around her, the Lily who thinks she's superior to everyone, really? Okay. Yeah, it was a really weird storyline because Lily and Hank go missing for a little while and they like skip classes and stuff. And, like Lily's skipping classes as well? What, to help him with his self-esteem? She helps him get rid of his, I think he has like a southern twang to his accent. So like she helps him to get rid of it. And I'm just like, she's skipping classes to help give this guy self-esteem boosts so that he can get an agent to be a, an underwear model. And I think they're like 14. I mean, there's a lot of things in the Princess Diaries series that is unbelievable, of course, but like trying to suspend my disbelief sometimes with the series is so hard to do. So the more I talk about this, the more I'm thinking I might lower this to a two stars because <laughs> it's so weird. Like, yeah, I think two stars. I mean, there's like so much to talk about it. Like seriously, there are so many other things that I've picked out about it, but I just, I don't want to be too long, honestly. I don't know if I can be bothered to even go through a lot of the random things that I've picked out. But anyway, that's book two. <laughs> Okay, book three. We go into book three with some drama with Mia now having a boyfriend in Kenny, you know, and she says something as well like, oh god, I'm 14 years old. I should have had a boyfriend by now. I'm 31 years old and I've never had a boyfriend. I've never been in a relationship. So like the fact that I felt called out by a 14 year old fictional girl made me feel like shit. I'm giving this book 1.5 stars. Not just because of that though. <laughs> Not just because of that. And again, like, I'm not going to be a proper hater of the series. Like, I am going to be very open-minded with a lot of it. I don't want to drag anyone's nostalgia down because of this. But I do just want to talk about what I'm thinking and feeling and what I'm reading. So we do have Mia. She doesn't love Kenny, which is valid. It is valid. And I don't blame her for all the pressures that she had to face in asking... Or you know, Kenny asking her out and her saying yes. Like, I don't blame her for that. The thing I do blame her for is that she is not appreciative whatsoever. She complains so much about the fact that she will never have a boy who likes her. She will never have a boy who is appreciative and treats her right. And Kenny comes along, who Mia admits there's nothing wrong with Kenny. Absolutely nothing wrong with Kenny. It's just he isn't Michael. So, like, she dismisses him. All the times that he's really nice to her, she dismisses completely. And yet she is mad with Kenny too for the majority of this book, for him not asking her to this winter dance. And I'm like, what do you actually want from Kenny, Mia? You don't want him to be your boyfriend, but you do want him to ask you to the dance. And yet you're rejecting him so outwardly and yet still stringing him along a little bit by doing all this, that and the other. I'm just like, Make up your mind, girl. This was so repetitive too. I think the majority of this book was Mia constantly complaining about Kenny and saying that he isn't Michael. She kept pining for Michael so much in this. Kenny isn't Michael. Why isn't Michael, you know, Kenny? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, there was so much of that. It got really repetitive. And it seems like Michael might be seeing a girl called Judith. So we do have like, this miscommunication storyline in this where Mia doesn't want to like approach Michael because she thinks he's dating someone else even though it turns out that he isn't. And so Mia, halfway through the book, she then gives anonymous letters to Michael. And I must say, Mia, you shit at algebra. You also kind of shit at writing poems. I'm not gonna lie, listen to this. I actually find it kind of creepy what she writes. And it might be because I just watched, was it Killer Lover Stalker on Netflix the other night? Which, that was really creepy messed up. So I have that true crime case in my mind as I'm reading this. So this is what Mia writes to Michael. Roses are red, violets are blue. You may not know it, but someone loves you. I'm like, why does that sound like a threat? Why does that sound like a threat, Mia? I can't get on board with that. I really can't. I mean, I feel like it is kind of an entertaining storyline. The fact that in the previous book, we had Kenny given Mia anonymous letters and her thing was Michael the entire time. Now Mia is the one giving the anonymous letters to Michael. So like, I, Storyline wise, that was good. I liked the storyline. <laughs> and I did just want Mia to just break up with Kenny. She kept getting such bad advice from everyone around her, from Clarice, from Lily. Oh my God, don't get me started on Lily. Tell me what's wrong with this interaction. Mia says, I really and truly value Kenny's companionship, but love, I mean, lo oh yeah, because Kenny said, I love you to her. He said, I love you to Mia. And Mia said, um, okay, and hung up. <laughs> I was like, I mean, yeah, don't tell him you love him too, because that would be a lie. Like, don't string him along like that, but putting the phone down on him. <laughs> so now this is why I'm reading The Princess Diaries, for the fake gossip. 
So obviously this isn't true or anything. Because that is pretty warm tea, if you ask me. But anyway, sorry, I totally ran away with that. Mia says, I really and truly value Kenny's companionship. But love, I mean love, that is a very big thing. I'm not, I mean, I don't. And then Lily says, I see fear of commitment. That's not the bad thing, but it is Lily trying to psychoanalyze Mia and doing it in such a bad way, which you can kind of feel with Lily, her parents are, I think, psychologists, and they analyze Lily all the time. So I can imagine she's picked that up from her parents. But a little bit earlier than that, the interaction that made me think, oh, Lily, come on, is when Mia doesn't let Kenny, like, kiss her. And Lily is, like, on the side of Kenny being like, you should just kiss him. Just kiss him even though that's not what Mia wants. And so Lily says, well, I'm just saying, if Kenny did say what you've said, he said, which she doesn't even believe that Kenny said, I love you to Mia. Mia tells Lily, he said, I love you to me. And Lily's like, I bet he didn't. I'm just like, Lily, shut up. <laughs> so she says, he can't express the depths of his feelings any other way, you know, other than verbally, since you won't let him physically. So she's berating Mia for not reciprocating the I love you. And so she's also berating her for not physically kissing him or doing anything physical with Kenny because Mia doesn't want to. Mia doesn't want to do that, which is valid. But because she doesn't do that, Lily thinks, oh, well, that's why Kenny said I love you because he can't express himself because he can't put his tongue in your mouth, essentially. You won't let him kiss you. So he has to express himself some other way. And she's making Mia feel like a bad person for doing that. I'm like, Lily, you kind of lost me here. Why would you want to pressure your best friend into kissing someone she doesn't want to kiss? I mean, again, I know Mia is stringing him along by letting him be her boyfriend. But to actually violate Mia, like, physically, when she doesn't want that? Like, no, that is a line you should never cross. And you know what? Even if Mia did love Kenny, say she did, and she wanted that relationship, if Mia doesn't want to kiss Kenny at any time, boyfriend or not, that is her prerogative. That's her prerogative. And again, I know they're 14 years old. They kind of don't know better because they're just, their minds are sponges and they're taking in society and society is shit. It's still so hard to read, especially coming from Lily. I just, I, I can't get on board with her. There's another storyline with Sebastiano, who is another cousin of Mia, who makes clothes for her, takes photos of her, goes into the times, which... Mia and her dad didn't approve, but Clarice did. So this is like another moment of like Clarice going behind Mia's back to do something. But then Clarice, oh, hi, you Tobu. Clarice, who for the majority of these books has been an awful person, she ends up turning a sort of new leaf by the end of this book. And I'm wondering if Meg watched the film, saw Julie Andrews' portrayal of Clarice and thought, you know what? That's what I want my Clarice to be like. So Clarice totally changes tune and stuff. And she justifies the fact that she lets Sebastiano publish the photos of Mia modeling. And then Mia's like, maybe it's best if I say in Genovia because I'm so embarrassed and all this kinds of stuff. Clarice is like being like really considerate and like very understanding and she's listening like very intently and she's seeing all of these inspirational things. I'm going to show you that you are just as pretty as those girls in the magazines you are always wishing you look like. It's upon that you know that you are not this hideous creature that you apparently think you are. If only you just have a little more confidence in yourself, show off once in a while. And like this whole like speech in like towards the end of the book is like that sounds more like Julie Andrews than it does Clarice from the first two books. And I do feel like there was like natural progression with Mia and Clarice getting a little bit closer and her becoming a bit of a better grandmother. I totally get that. But it kind of still feels like a bit of a 180 in this book with a Clarice character. It really does feel like a totally different character. And she's like, no Mia, you're not gonna come to and live in Genovia to run away from your problems. The Clarice from book one would have kidnapped her and put her on a plane and forced her and locked her in a cell if she had to. You know, that's the kind of person Clarice was in book one. And now in book three, like that character progression was a little bit too quick for my liking. It's a little bit fishy. And this came out after the movie, so just saying. So, I mean, obviously there's like lots of things I could talk about, but let's talk about Mia and Michael. So in this book, their kind of slow burn romance, which felt very one-sided from Mia's part, but when you think about it, it does actually look like Michael has been interested in her the entire time. Like it is a little bit weird how much attention Michael gave Mia and Mia would say, oh, it's because I'm Lily's best friend. That's why. But I'm still like, mm, I, I don't think that's the case. Like, you can kind of see it coming. Kenny and Mia do break up, which is great. At least she's not stringing them along. Even though Clarice, before her apparent sudden character change, was manipulating Mia to stay with Kenny because Kenny was letting Mia copy the biology stuff. So the finals are happening too. So Mia needs to copy off Kenny. And Clarice is like, 
I think you should wait because, you know, you don't want your grades to drop. And also Kenny's grades would drop as well if you broke up with them right before finals. Like, she is, like, very manipulative. Like, she is, like, really, Clarice? You're encouraging this behaviour? So, like, yeah, that's why I'm also a little bit fishy with the whole character change at the end. They break up and Michael realises that Mia is the one sending the notes. Uh, he has this whole, like, segment at this winter... What was this? Because, like, there's a winter dance. There's, like, a winter carnival. So it's the winter carnival. Michael shows, like, the poem. And Mia, like, freaks out. Like, she's like, oh, shit, I've been caught, kind of thing. And obviously the reaction from that is, like, a confirmation to Michael that it was Mia who was sending it. Mia breaks up with Kenny. She runs off. She goes home. She doesn't want to go to the winter dance thing. But then she does end up going to the winter dance after Clarissa's speech. And at this dance, well, one, it turns out that Lily knew about, you know, Meghan and Mia's feelings this entire time. And one of the reasons why Mia didn't want to say anything was because she didn't want Lily to flip out on Mia for liking her brother. And also Tina had apparently told Lily also. And I'm like, Tina, you were supposed to keep that secret. Because at the start of the book, Mia does tell Tina, yeah, I kind of do have a thing for Michael. But like, does nobody have any kind of loyalty in this book? This is not really showing very good friendships at all. Any good female relationships. It's just, it's non-existent. Anyway, we do have Mia getting to the winter dance thing. And he's like, I didn't think you were coming. The thing is, Michael went on, I knew it was you who was leaving those cards. Lily had apparently told Michael that Mia had feelings. And Lily found out from Tina. And then, no first, no asking my permission, no hesitation whatsoever. He just leaned down and kissed me right on the lips. Lily knew all along but didn't say anything until a few days ago because she found out it was an interesting social experiment to say how long it would take for us to figure it out on our own. I'll tell you what this is, self actualization So, again, okay, fucking hate that. Okay, so the thing with Michael and Mia though is that I can't get on board with a relationship between an 18-year-old and a 14-year-old. I don't like it. And like, I'm worried because... I have a feeling that Michael and Mia are the it couple of the series. I feel like they're going to be the big thing, the big romance. And I know Michael was only in movie one. And I don't think the movies follow the books very well or anything like that. I think just like loose inspiration. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I want to continue the series. I want to see where the, the plot goes. In the next book, because we end the book as well, because um, Mia's going to go to Genovia over like the Christmas break and do some like princess duties. That's the kind of stuff I'm interested in reading about. So I think I will really like the next book because of those things. I'm kind of a little bit fed up now of the more focus on the high school life rather than the princess life. Like I feel like it's just been overwhelmingly high school petty drama the past three books now that it was fine to begin with because we had the adjustment of her just finding out but the whole princess stuff has kind of been cast to the wayside we only get little glimpses of it but like I feel like in book four we're gonna go to Genovia like, I'm, I'm so excited about that but oh my god I, I, I don't know how I feel about Miera Michael obviously they're portrayed to be romantic and like it was a different time in the early 2000s but I'm still I, I can't root for their love. I can't root for it. I, I, I just physically can't. So like, do I continue reading the series and just not really put too much focus on that? However, because of how much the previous three books have been Mia in love with Michael, considering like how much that's been so prominent, it's gonna be way more prominent moving forward now that they've actually kissed. Also, I'm kind of surprised they kissed in this book. I thought it would have taken a lot longer, but Never mind, I guess book three is the one. I'm gonna continue, because I, I really am interested, but like, uh, am I the only one? Because I try to look up reviews as well to see what other people have been saying about it, but like, no one's really talking about the age gap. No one's talking about the fact that Mia is a minor during all of this. And Michael is 18. And he's definitely 18, because Mia said in book one, Josh and Michael are the same age. And we know that Josh is 18. She says he is 18. So Michael is 18. Mia's a minor. I'm scared. I'm, I'm actually scared. <laughs> Two more books down. Let's talk about book number four, Mia Goes Forth. I think I'm going to stop rating these books now because I think it's just unfair of me to do that because I... I, I... I have a lot of problems <laughs> and I'm finding it harder and harder to enjoy these the more I'm reading them because I just, uh, it's so hard when you have a character like Mia, but not just Mia, I think the entire cast of characters 
have problems. I, I do. I mean, it's messy and I do love messiness. I love chaos and that's exactly what the series represents. But I find it so hard to even find some enjoyment in it. And mainly because I was really hoping that we would get more on the princess front. I really did want to see more of Genovia. I wanted to get more insight into the politics of Genovia, which I know like getting told that through a 14 year old girl is like really, really hard to do. And obviously her priorities are elsewhere, but there is just nothing glamorous about the entire thing. There is nothing appealing about anything to do with anything outside of Michael. I feel like these books have turned from the Princess Diaries to the Michael Diaries because they're about 90% Mia talking about Michael. The first 60 pages of book four is Mia in Genovia and it's now like mid-January to nearly the end of January and she only has like a week or so left in Genovia. So she's already had a few weeks there but all she tells us is how boring it is and like how awful it is to live in a castle and I just feel like one of the appeals of this series is the fact that Mia turns out to be a princess and we are getting absolutely nothing positive like whatsoever about it and I guess that is both good and bad. I mean I guess it's the way that the author wants to portray princessdom or however you call it, like the, the royalty I guess because Mia just doesn't want anything to do with it. Like not a single thing in Mia wants anything to do with being a princess. All she wants is to be Michael's girlfriend and now in book four she is his girlfriend. So now that we have overcome that hurdle What's next? Mia doubting everything and making drama for herself and making it harder for not just herself but Michael as well. And like, again, like I'm not on board with the whole Michael and Mia thing because I do find that age gap, like a, a romance between a senior and a freshman to be really icky to me. But I'm not gonna like drone on too much about that because I feel like you guys already know. And I'm not saying like Michael's a terrible person. In fact, he's probably one of the more likable characters because he's not outwardly awful like Mia, Lily, Grammia, you know what I mean? It's like, there are so many bad characters that you kind of have to take the good characters when they come, especially with Mia too. I'm not noticing any growth with her because it seems like every single book the only time she changes is when she gets her own way and like again I, I know she's a teenager but I feel like I can't just keep using that excuse for every single bad thing that Mia does and the way that she goes on because she's getting more and more insufferable and the way that Meg Cabot or Cabot I don't know how to pronounce her last name the way that she's portraying Mia is like Shadi, there are more facets to her. Shadi, there are more sides to me. Like, she's just coming across as so boy crazy that it's taken over her life. And it's like really, well, it's depressing me to read about because it's just, I, I, I want to see the other sides of Mia's life. I want to see her trying to be a princess. I want to see Genovia. I want to see how she like fits in with the whole thing. But we're not seeing any of that because 59 of the 60 pages were in Genovia. Mia has talked about Michael and how much she misses Michael and how much he's a bad girlfriend because they've been together for like three weeks and she forgot his birthday. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I just want more. I want different things than what we're getting with this series. Grammia has gone back to being an absolute awful person too. Like she had a little bit of a character change by the end of the third book because I thought, oh, maybe the author so in loved the Princess Diaries movie and thought, you know what, Julie Andrews makes a better Clarice than Clarice in the book does. And she's kind of gone back on that. Like Clarice is awful again. <laughs> and it's really interesting as well because a big plot line of this book is the fact that there was a movie made out of Mia's life and uh, Lily brings it up or just the movie of your life, or hadn't you heard your life stories be made into a movie of the week? You were portrayed as shy and awkward. They made your grandmother all kindly and sympathetic to your plight. It was the grossest mischaracterization I've seen since Shakespeare and love. And also Lily says, they portrayed me as less than fully supportive of your royalness. They made out like, after you first got that stupid haircut, I mocked you for being shallow and a trend follower. I was your number one supportive friend through the whole thing. I mean, even Mia says like, that's untrue, that's like false. But I can't believe like how delusional Lily is. I sincerely hope that you are laughing in disbelief over the idea that I was anything less than a good friend to you, Mia. All Lily is, is an absolute awful friend to Mia. Like all the friendships, apart from Tina, but then again, Mia is awful to Tina. Pretty much all the friendships in this are toxic and awful. It's like Meg said, you know what? Teenagers get a bad rep, let's make it worse. That's what she did. She's made the whole thing just look even worse. Like I know teenagers can be very complex, but the way that Meg portrays Mia and Lily and her friends, they are just so one-dimensional, boy crazy. They have the worst morals that I'm actually genuinely concerned for them. I'm concerned that they've learned all the wrong things. The way that they act, the way they go on isn't being corrected. I'm like, 
they cannot grow up to be like this, please. Like, let's change their behavior. Start, because I've read five books now. I'm halfway through the original 10 book series. So I'm like, come on, where's the growth? And Mia as well, like she is so overdramatic. And it's weird because she is very aware of world issues and she does want to make changes and make the planet better. But she's like, in less than a year's period, have been through so much trauma and angst, it is a wonder I am not an Oprah every single day. Like, she is so unaware of herself. She says things that are just so shallow and self-obsessed, and then she'll say something else that's, like, very selfless, and I'm like, okay, that's the me I kind of like. But then she goes back to being her old self. An example of her being a bad friend is that when Tina rings, uh, when she's in Genovia, Tina sprained her ankle on a slope yesterday, oh, thank you, God, for causing Tina to sprain her ankle so that she could be here for me in my hour of need. So, like, she is grateful for the fact that her friend has hurt herself, that she has a sprained ankle, so that Mia can talk to her about her problems. Because if Tina hadn't have sprained her ankle, then Tina wouldn't have been in the resort or wherever she is uh, skiing to talk to Mia. You know what I mean? It's like... Uh, give me one good reason why I should like Mia. Please, give me something, Meg. Just give me a crumb. I also wish I would stop using the R word. Like, I know, again, it's a bit of a dated book, but, like, the R word is dropped nearly constantly. Oh, my God. If you are speaking of Michael Moskovitz, I most certainly am. He is never far from my thoughts because he is my heart's breath. Again, concerned. So the majority of the first half of this book is Mia trying to find something to get Michael for his birthday. So she ends up stealing something from the... Palais de Genovia Museum. Uh, she says, well, nobody else was using it, so I don't say why I can't. I'm the princess of Genovia, after all. I own everything in that museum anyway, or at least the royal family does. And I'm like, that's some colonial bullshit. That is some colonial bullshit right there. I cannot get on board with that. Because even though Mia rejects the idea of being a princess, she'll still use it to her advantage. So I'm like, which is it, Mia? Which do you want to be? Not a princess or a princess? It's like she wants to reap the benefits of being a princess in not suffer the consequences for it. You know what I mean? It's like, she's so confusing. But again, I, I know she's a teenager, but... Mm. Gramia also makes Mia read Jane Eyre, which gives her the wrong impression of what boys want. So she gets this impression that men want the chase. Like, Mia needs to be a little bit more hard to get, even though they are officially a couple now. So it's like, what's the point? Even Mia at one point says there's no point playing games, which is great. But then Mia always just kind of contradicts herself, goes back on the lessons that she learned, or like kind of the morals that she says out loud and she does the complete opposite. It's honestly, uh, I hate how these books are making me feel like a boring old adult. You know what I mean? It's like I'm doing my absolute best to just say the positives and be happy and, you know, enjoy the chaos and how relatable me I can come across as sometimes. Because again, like, I have a lot of self-doubt. I make drama for myself in my head a lot of the time too. But I hope to God that I'm not as annoying as this or ever annoying as this as a teenager. I know I was a little bit of a hot-headed teenager sometimes, but I don't think I was this bad. So I don't know, maybe if I did find the love of my life while I was a teenager, maybe I would be more like this. This is also fiction. Like, we didn't have to purposefully make Mia this awful. It's genuinely so concerning. She keeps a dried piece of toast that Michael had ate on the first day. Like, she keeps a dried piece of toast. That is weird. I know you want to keep a memento of the first day, but a dried piece of toast? That's disgusting. It's gonna go moldy. It's gonna go nasty. And even this part where she says, I think I love Michael more than I love my mum and dad. It sounds terrible to say, but I can't help it. It's just how I feel. Again, like, where's the intervention? This is really genuinely concerning. She's been going out with him for like three weeks, three or four weeks, and she's only seen him for a day, essentially, by this point, because her and Michael got together on that last day of like winter, and then the next day Mia had to fly to Genovia. So like, she's seen him for one day. They've been boyfriend and girlfriend for one day in person. Just like, come on, girl. She needs a good influence. That's the thing. It's like, I can't blame Mia for all of this. She needs a good, positive influence. Her mum's not great. Her mum's pretty distant. I know she's pregnant and stuff, but like, she's still not a great mum. And Clarice, don't get me started on Clarice, her dad. She needs a good role model. Where are the good role models? <laughs> Mia does play those games with Michael. She doesn't return his calls because again, like she doesn't want him to feel like it was too easy, but then she doesn't want him to go to someone else. There's a lot of back and forth with that, but I guess it kind of made for some comedic moments with that whole like miscommunication thing. So I can appreciate some of the humor sometimes. It's a little bit like, you know, that's all Raven, how Raven would have a vision and then end up making things worse, which I love that's all Raven, it's one of my favorite shows. This is in a more annoying way. 
<laughs> but I can understand where it's coming from, so I'm not wholly negative with that. But she does make things worse for herself by not being honest. But Michael should be running for the hills as well, because whenever Michael asks Mia to do something, she always has to check in with her mum first. If you are an 18 year old guy and you are dating someone who has to keep checking with their parents if they can do things with you, why are you not self-actualizing and realizing that this is not the one for you. Please, he should be running for the hills. Lily ends up getting a breakfast meeting with the producers of that movie. They say it's a made for TV movie in this, but I feel like all the references to it makes it sound like it was actually like the movie with like Julie Andrews and Hathaway. They say things about like Lana being portrayed by somebody who they like. It sounds like the actual movie that we saw, but they say made for TV movie in this. Probably because like Lily does say bad things about it that uh, maybe it was just a way for Meg to cover her back if anything ever came up about that, maybe. But I'm like, how in the world did Lily get a meeting with the producers of the movie? Like, come on. Like, I know she was a character in it herself, but she is herself a 14 year old girl. Why would the producers meet her? Because she didn't like her portrayal. Like they just wouldn't, you know what I mean? It's like, what? And then they end up suggesting that they could take Lily Tells It Like It Is to actual networks on television, like ABC, CBS and stuff. I'm like, no, they wouldn't do that. She again is 14 years old. Like sometimes this is very realistic in its depictions of a chaotic teenage mind. But then there are other times when I'm like, okay, come on. Because if we want to go the little bit of a farcical route with the whole like, turns out to be a princess thing, then surely she could have leaned into that. If you're going to be unrealistic, then come on, lean into it. Don't just like have moments like this where, oh, Lily gets a meeting with the producers. I'm like, that just wouldn't happen. Mia makes this huge deal about being gifted and talented. She doesn't want to be taken out of it because she wants to see Michael. And she honestly makes this huge deal about it. Like she is shouting on pages like look at this like oh, look at all these pleases like she's saying like please 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 let me be in gifted and talented so i can say michael and then she gets into gifted and talented like she's still in it and then she has this whole spiel about feeling depressed i know i shouldn't be these are all the great things that i have and she lists the great things that she has she's with the love of her life she's not flunking algebra she's no longer in genovia doesn't have kenny for her bio partner she has really cool friends and then she says but say that is the problem i have all these great things I should be totally happy, I should be over the moon, but I can't shake this feeling that I am dot 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 well a reject. And I'm like, well explain. And then she's like, now I will tell you why I feel this way. I mean, take gift and talent class for example. What am I doing in here? I am a poser, I should not be here. I'm like, you've just made this whole deal about being gifted and talented, like literally shouting on the page like, I wanna be in it, I need to say Michael so badly. And then she gets in it and she's like, why am I here? Like this is making me depressed. I shouldn't even be here. I'm like, what do you want? She does think that she doesn't have any kind of... Oh, there was a Charmed reference as well. She says, in-depth analysis of last night's episode of Charmed and how cute Rose McGowan's top was. And then Michael says he thinks Charmed is for seal. And I'm like, dump him. I'm watching Charmed currently with my patrons and we did a Charmed watch along last night. And I love the fact that there was a mention of like Alyssa Milano and the source of all evil. I think in book five. And I was like, oh my God, literally last night we were fighting the source of all evil. Like, I mean, oh my God, I love it. I love Charm so much, it's my favorite TV show. So I love all the references. I love the reference to Smallville as well. And the fact that they fancy Tom Welling who plays, you know, Clark Kent. I fancied him too, back in the day, and I still do, not gonna lie. So things like that, I love the pop culture references. I know they're a bit dated now, because like Gilmore Girls, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, but like, I love it so much. Like, please don't ever take those references out. One of my favorite things about the Princess Diary series is spotting the pop culture references. We end up finding, I guess, some kind of path for Mia, and this is something I'm actually interested in. Mia wants to now be a writer, and I love that idea, honestly, because she does write in her journal. And yes, her poems are terrible. She can't write for shit when it comes to poems. She can write a story. So like, I'm kind of invested in her maybe wanting to continue this idea of being a writer. I think that would be great for her. And if that gets her mind off Michael sometimes and gives her some individuality, then perfect, I'm all for it. But honestly, the whole back and forth between what she wants and what she doesn't want is so annoying. Part of the journey of achieving self-actualization is that you have to reach it on your own without help or guidance from others. I'm wondering if maybe I should read the next book with some wine or something or some alcohol and take a shot every single time self-actualization is mentioned. One thing that, again, is so unbelievable with Mia is the fact that her grandmother pulls her out of class to take her shopping in Chanel. Surely that would be anybody's dream. But the fact that Mia is shouting, I hate my grandmother, I hate my grandmother, I hate my grandmother, I hate my grandmother. And yet she takes her 
shopping. She gets Mia out of school, which, yeah, I mean, that's a bad thing, right? But when you're a teenager, sometimes that's awesome. And then you're going shopping in Chanel. Like, why are all of these glamorous things that are happening, things that I want to see, like, I want to see the princess side of life for Mia. I want to see that. I want to see, like, the benefits from it. I want to see the glam, the glitz and the glam. But, like, I'm seeing none of that because Mia rejects it so utterly that it's starting to come across now as so unbelievable that she would do this. She's saying like, you need a gown for the black and white ball at the Contessa Trevani's this Friday. But surely Mia could just like be grateful for something. Surely she can be like happy and positive about things. But all she does is like, I hate this, I hate that. I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna do that. I'm just like, just try, please just try. Give me something to be excited about. I wanna see this side of life because that's kind of the difference between just reading a normal teenager's diary, which I don't want to do, but like having that princess element of it gives it an edge. But that edge is totally dulled because Mia doesn't show us any of it. And when she does show us something, she says how awful it is. And I'm like, come on Mia, you just gone shopping in Chanel. Be grateful, but don't skip school kids. I know Mia doesn't want to go to this ball, but like she's getting these opportunities where she can like dress up and be so amazing, especially since a big plot point of book five is how much she wants to go to the prom and how much she wants to dress up and be like all this and the other. The only reason that she wants to go to the prom over going to this ball is because she wants Michael to take her to the prom. Whereas in this one, it's all to do with Genovia in her princess side. I'm like, oh, please just accept it a little bit, please. Please. And she's saying that her grandmother is destroying her life. Uh, she sent her up with her cousin, Prince Rene, which is weird. I guess like royalty, yes, it is kept in the family. Sometimes they do date their cousins. Her grandma, when Mia gets out of the ball because her dad is like, don't worry, I'll make sure you don't have to go. When her dad does that, grandma, she is distraught. She is so upset. She manipulates Mia. Grandma says to Mia after Mia backs out, it will be weeks before I'll be able to show my face in public. I'm fine. At least I will be once I get over the humiliation. I'm only suffering from the mortification of having a granddaughter who doesn't love me. That boy, that boy again. And I suppose as Michael is more important to you than I am, which Mia says is a resounding yes. And Grandma is like, Elena has, ever since she was a kid, always lorded over me. I want to show what a lovely and accomplished granddaughter I have so I could show her up. And now I have to tell her that my granddaughter doesn't love me enough to put aside her new boyfriend for one single night. This is so manipulative. Like I do sometimes agree with Grammy that Mia is too obsessed with Michael that she is ignoring everything else. She also just wants Mia to be there so she can show her friend up as well. She herself doesn't even want Mia just to be there to be supportive or that it'll be a good time for her or anything. She just wants her to be there so she can show up her friend. Again, like this is why Mia is a terrible person, Grammy is a terrible person. It's like they cancel each other out sometimes. Sometimes it's hard to root for any of them because like they're both terrible. And then yeah, Mia does say that she will go. She's been guilted into it, which again is so toxic, it's so bad. And Mia finally sees the movie of her life. I'm like, surely she would have seen it before now. Again, this is something that's probably a bit unrealistic. The girl who played me was way prettier than I am. I can see why Lily is so mad. The guy who played Michael was a tall babe in the movie he and I end up together. Mia also wrote this absolutely awful poem again with the R word. She really needs to stop using that word. Michael also wants to take Mia to this place to see Star Wars and it's like a proper first aid for them, which is kind of another reason why Mia didn't want to go to the ball. I feel like I'm sounding so silly talking about this. I really do. It's like the pettiest of dramas and I'm talking about it as if it was real. Uh, also, Grammia allegedly kept the Nazis from trash in Genovia by having Hitler over for tea. I remember this was a weird thing, but again, I know like the whole politics with like royalty and stuff that was happening during World War II. I get it, but like, can you imagine Julie Andrews sitting with Adolf Hitler having tea? However, it does turn out in this book that Grammia lied about her age because she would have been five years old during World War II, so like none of this was true. But it is weird that Grammia would say stuff like this. Another thing, actually, she doesn't just guilt Mia to go to this ball. She also blackmails her too, because she finds out that Mia stole something from that museum. And Grammia's like, what dance that is all I'm asking for, I believe you owe it to me. And then Mia's like, how so? Oh, only because of a little something that was recently found to be missing from the Palace Museum a priceless object. But I kind of find it funny as well that Mia was like, you know what, Premier? I'll be happy to dance with Ronnie, no problem. I love how Mia like changes her tune so quickly there. Like some parts of it can be funny. Lana is also at this ball and Mia says, I actually sort of started feeling sorry for Lana. I mean, she's so shallow. She can't see past how somebody looks. She never bothers to stop and try to see the person they might be inside. It's weird because Mia is such a hypocrite here because she does see the good inside of people like Boris, for example. She sees the good inside Boris and she sees that he is a good person. And yet she still always criticizes him. and acts like he's gross and things like that. And I'm just like, Mia, you're talking about yourself here. Mia has been a worse character than Lana, her bully. It's weird, isn't it? Like we see more of Mia being an awful person than we do her own bully.
Anyway, Renee helps Mia escape and go to Michael by the end of it, which honestly, Michael was very sweet to bring the screening room to Mia, but do I love what he's doing? I was really hoping that the entire book would have been set in Genovia, but I feel like even if it was set in Genovia, I would hate it because all through the book, all Mia would be talking about is how much she misses Michael because the 60 pages we got of it, most of it was talking about Michael. What part of this is about being a princess? Like genuinely barely anything. So unfortunately a little bit of a miss, but I am going to stop rating these books now because I genuinely feel like I would just be way too negative about it all and I don't want to be that way. I really don't. And I do think it would be a little bit unfair. So no more ratings. I apologize. I will be rating them myself personally, but I won't be saying them out loud. But yeah, that was book four. Okay, book five now. So we jump from January 23rd at the end of book four to April 30th at the start of this. So we've just skipped like three whole months. And we go from Mia being obsessed with Michael and making problems for herself and missing him for the start of it in book four to her now obsessing over prom. Oh my gosh, I was really, really, really fed up with the way Mia went on about this goddamn fucking prom. It's not even her prom, it's Michael's prom. And again, because he's a senior, he is 18 years old. Even though there is a mistake on 158, where Mia says he acts like a typical male 17 year old, that is a mistake because he turned 18 at the very start of book four. He's a senior, he's about to go off. So he is 17 to 18 in books one through five. He's not 17. That is a mistake on the author's part. I just want to clear that up. Josh, who is in Michael's year, is 18, and he was 18 in book one. So that is the senior year of this is 17 to 18. It's his prom. It's not even Mia's. And yet all through this book, hello, isn't anyone thinking about the prom? Anyone at all? I'm like, no, because you're all freshmen. It's not even your prom year. The way that she like feels like she deserves to go to this prom. Like her entire high school years will be absolutely terrible and over and she will have bad memories if she doesn't go to this prom. I'm like, it's not even your prom. Wait until your prom. Wait until you graduate in like three more years. Get Michael to go to the prom with you. Michael doesn't want to go to the prom. He says like, oh, it's, it's, it's lame. It's not what I want to do. Like it's not for him. I didn't go to my prom. It wasn't for me either. And I feel like the way that Mia pressures Michael into going to his own prom. In fact, she even goes behind his back to get his band to play at the prom, which Michael does concede. He does do it. But like, again, why can't Mia just respect his wishes? Why does she constantly have to undermine him and make him change his ways in order for her to be happy. This is the thing. This is why I'm having a big issue with Mia. She doesn't have character growth. She just gets her own way. She did have character growth in the first book. I felt like anyway, don't feel like she has any more growth to give. It was interesting the fact that this book does celebrate Mia's birthday because her birthday is on May 1st. And we have this whole plot line of Mia going to this nice restaurant with her mum, her stepdad, her dad, her grandma. And at this restaurant, Grammy takes a dog and the dog is on Prozac and the dog runs around and gets the busboy in trouble. So Grammy gets this busboy fired, which then leads to Lily orchestrating this strike and this rally for busboys to get better pay, to get better treatment, and to get Jang Boo, who was the busboy that Grammy fired, his job back. So the main plot of this book is like the strike and the prom. Again, like two kind of fascinating things to examine if Mia wasn't a terrible narrator, if she wasn't such a self-absorbed and selfish character. Like she has a whole list of things to be grateful for. Super loving boyfriend, next and best friend, which is false. A great mom, a great stepdad, a dad will give me something I want. But hello, is it too much to ask that I get the one thing for my birthday that I've always wanted, and that is one perfect night at the prom? Like, no! Like, she's showing, like, just how ungrateful and selfish she is. And especially since she has this whole thing at the start of the book where she thinks that she is the reason that Jang Boo got fired from his job, because if she wasn't born, then they wouldn't have had this birthday party, birthday dinner at the restaurant for her, and then Grammy wouldn't have brought her dog, and then the dog wouldn't have caused chaos and gotten Jang Boo fired. So, like, she has all of this, and then so like a few chapters later, Lily is like, we're going to do all of this to get Jang Bei's job back. We're going to go have this rally and we're going to protest. And then Mia's like, I don't think I can be expected to help get Jang Bei's job back when I can't even get my own boyfriend asked me to, to the prom. Lily accused me of being more concerned for myself than for Jang Bei's three starving children. I am very concerned about Jang Bei, but it's a dog eat dog world out there. And right now I have problems of my own. I'm almost positive Jang Bei would understand. Girl, 
what are your priorities? This is why I feel like it's so bad for her. Like, she needs better lessons in being a decent human being. Sometimes she shows signs of being a decent human being. And then there are other times when, like, again, like, she was so... Well, she blamed herself for Zhang Bu's getting fired. Then as soon as the solution is presented to her, Mia wants nothing to do with it. I'm like, Mia, what do you want then? What are you doing? Do you feel bad for Zhang Bu? Do you feel bad that your existence meant that he got fired? Or are you just that much more concerned about yourself in this fucking prom? Come on, girl. And Mia does just because she wants all of this to get out of her hair. Like, she's sick of it. She even says to Grammy, like, can you just ring the restaurant and just say it was your fault? She's like, he'll find another. Not without references, I pointed out. So he can go back to his native land, Grammy said. Like, she is racist. She's homophobic. She's a terrible grandmother. I totally understand why Mia is the way she is. Pretty much everyone around her is awful. This is testing my absolute limits. And don't even get me started on Mia and Asperger's disease. Like, she has to write a, a report on Asperger's. So she's in health and safety, and she says, when we do diseases, I got Asperger's syndrome. Why couldn't I have a cool disease like Ebola fever? It's so unfair. And then she keeps bringing up Asperger's. Like, it turns out things most definitely can get worse than getting Asperger's syndrome as your health and safety project. I ran out of there without a word of explanation to anyone. Like, I had suddenly developed Asperger's syndrome or something. And then she writes a whole report where she pretty much says, oh my god, we all have Asperger's syndrome. This is terrible. Says language or word as well in relation to Asperger's. It's a terrible report. I hope she failed. I hope her teacher told her why she is awful of thinking all of these things and corrects her because the way that she just like make fun of this whole thing and the way that, she, again, like, she's like, oh my god, we all have Asperger's. Lily has Asperger's. This is a sign that I have Asperger's. I'm just like, can you just stop making everything about yourself? Please, for two seconds. Oh, her mum was taped and charmed as well. She says, Charmed is actually a very feminist show because it portrays young women who fight evil without the help of males. Again, I will love any kind of Charmed reference. And they're getting more and more. So I feel like through writing book four and five, Meg Cabot was, like, very into her Charmed at that time. <laughs> okay, huge drama in this as well. It was interesting to read but Lily she takes Zhang Bu to Mia's birthday party and they do seven minutes in heaven in front of Boris who is Lily's boyfriend so she literally pretty much dumps Boris without telling him that he's dumped starts kissing this other guy in front of him like takes him into like the seven minutes in heaven closet gets the whole party cancelled because Mr Giannani comes in and says it and like cancels Mia's party which is awful I feel so bad for Mia for doing that but yeah Lily does all of this for Boris and she doesn't even care and then when Boris is like please have I done something wrong like he's so heartbroken over it she's like you've now achieved self-actualization like I don't need you anymore like she's so cavalier about it like she really is so heartless about the whole thing and it breaks Boris's heart it really does and Lily says that she's in love with Changbu now but what I don't love is that Boris later on he takes this globe in class and he threatens Lily. He's like, if you don't take me back, I'm gonna drop this globe on my head. And I'm like, okay, Boris, I don't care how old you are, that's not right. You do not threaten to hurt yourself to pressure someone to take you back. Please don't do it again. As heartbroken as I feel for Boris because of how awful Lily has treated him, that wasn't good, Boris. Boris and Tina end up getting together, which again, drama. And Lily is heartbroken over it. So her and Jangbe were split up. Lily wants Boris back. So I'm like, the way that Lily treated him, like she doesn't deserve him back. And I don't want Boris to be with Lily. And Boris and Tina are probably the most, like nicest, I guess, of the characters, even though Boris did just threaten Lily uh, to hurt himself, to take him back. That wasn't great. Tina is probably the only character who is genuinely lovely. Oh, also a weird thing as well. I think I forgot to mention it in this one, but about Tina. So about the movie of her life, Tina was kind of a little bit upset that she wasn't included in it. But the reason she wasn't included in it was because her dad, uh, Tina is the one with the bodyguard. Her dad was like, I don't want you on television. Like it could be a, a, a risk, you know what I mean? However, in book three, was it book three or book two? When Mia mentions Tina and her bodyguard and calls her a freak on television and how the family were ecstatic that Tina was mentioned on television, that her family from abroad were even trying to tune in to watch Tina got mentioned. I'm like, then why wouldn't she be in the movie? You know what I mean? Like, the family was so proud that Tina was mentioned on TV, and yet now, her dad is against Tina being on TV. You know what I mean? It's like... Anyway, where was I? Yeah, I feel bad for Boris, but I hated him threatening Lily that he was gonna hurt himself. Hated that. Another plot as well is that we do have the birth of Mia's younger brother, Rocky, and that happens like right at the very end. So the prom is canceled because of the whole strike stuff, but then Grammy gets the prom back. So it wasn't really like a big deal or anything. And then Mia does end up going to the prom. She's happy. 
yay, I guess. But Rocky is also born at the same time. But the prom was cancelled for a brief period of time because of the strike, which Mia blamed her Grammya for, and like pretty much everyone did too, and they also blamed Mia. But Grammya ends up living with Mia for a little bit, and Grammya, she starts breaking Mia's things because Mia doesn't serve her. Like, she wants water with, like, honey and lemon, I think, and then Mia's like, no. So Grammya starts to smash her stuff. Not Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews would never. Again, like, I'm just finding so many flaws with these characters, it's so hard to find anything good about them anymore. We end the book with, oh my god, I'm self-actualized, I got to go to the prom. I'm like, no, you just got your own way. You're not self-actualized. I'll not rate that book either. <laughs> what am I gonna do? I have seven books left. The thing is though, I'm not hating myself reading these books. I hated myself during the Vampire Diaries. Like I was really hating that experience. And while these characters do make me angry, again, I'm not hating myself. I feel like I'm too self-actualized to hate myself right now. I am trying to get through the Princess Diaries books and I'm now on book six and I feel like I need to uh, have some kind of drinking game at this point because even though this is the halfway point, this is six out of 12, I, I just, I, I need to add a little bit of fun. I need to add a little bit of fun to it. So what I'm doing is I am going to do a little bit of a drinking game. So I have myself a vodka vanilla Coke. I was actually going to dip into my, this is a uh, cranberry martini but it's in like this kind of thing that looks like a purse and I, I'm just like isn't this like Soul Princess Diaries? This is Soul Princess Diaries oh my god I haven't tried it yet so I don't know if it's any good but I'm saving this for Sunday because I'm going to do a Princess Diaries movie marathon on Patreon so I'm saving this but I just wanted to show it off because it, it looks so good it matches my outfit it matches my outfit and we sell these at the Cafe of the Gav. Handbag martinis, exactly. I've got plenty of ice in this. I, I feel, because it's only 5 p.m. here, so already I shouldn't be doing this. But I feel like I need to. I hope it's not too strong is the only thing. And like, just so you guys know, I, I it is vodka. It's like, it's not just Coke. I know it looks just like Coke, but it's not. It's not. And that's perfect, actually. It's not too strong. Um, yes, I, I didn't drink yesterday. So that's one day. <laughs> maybe don't watch the vlog. <laughs> I would say maybe don't watch the vlog. Uh, I had to drink 11 times during that sprint for the first 53 pages of The Princess Diaries 6. Uh, I decided for my drinking game, I'm going to drink every time Lily's a hypocrite, any random mentions of Michael, when Mia's overdramatic, when Mia is shallow, pop culture references I like, anything inappropriate happens, and future problematic celebrity mentions. So, like, we had a mention of Josh Bell in this, and obviously, like, he becomes different as uh, he grows up. And also Chloe Mack from Smallville, and she ended up getting arrested for being part of a cult. You know, I'm just trying to make it, like, fun for myself. So I feel like that's, that's how I, I did. How drunk are you planning on getting in, the, in these scripts? <laughs> If I was if I was planning on getting like proper proper drunk, I mean I do have vodka here just in case I do need to top up. But I, if I really wanted to get drunk, I would have added things like every time Clarice is problematic, every time Mia uh, says something nasty about someone. You know, there are things I could add to make myself drunk. So I've kind of taken those things out to make sure that I don't. Um, and also, actually, really weird. They haven't mentioned self-actualization so far in this book, and they mention it like 55 times per book so far. So I'm like, hmm, interesting. Before you think that I'm just going to be completely negative about the Princess Diary series, I do want to say that I have read the next three books, and uh, book six and seven I really did like. I liked them a lot. They were kind of going in this trajectory that I was really appreciating in terms of Mia's personal development and what she can bring to the whole princess role that she's found herself in. Because yeah, again, like she doesn't really do much with the whole princess side of things. It's mainly Mia in high school. That's like 90% of what we get in these books. But book six and seven, I thought did a really good job at balancing uh, well, maybe not balancing the two because I still think like the princess thing is very overshadowed. But there were things in Mia's high school life that I think would have developed really well into her princess life. Like skills that she was learning, the development she was going through. It was so good. And then we get to book eight. We get to book eight and I am now going to restructure 
how I proceed with this vlog after book eight, but I will get into that when I get to book eight. Putting that down for now and putting book seven down for now. Let's talk about book six. So I ended up reading this one during reading sprints on my channel. I love doing some like live reading sprints every now and then. And I ended up reading the full book. So in this book, Mia is now a sophomore and Michael's gone off to college. And honestly, that was like the best thing that could have happened in this book. I was like, yes, we're gonna get less of Michael. And what was great as well is that Mia didn't bring him up that much really like she had a lot going on herself but even then like say when she went to Genovia in book four or five now they're all blending into one and she went to Genovia the majority of her time in Genovia was her mentioning how much she misses Michael and I thought that's what we were going to get in book six too I thought all we were going to get was like how much she misses Michael being in G&T and how much she misses him being around and stuff like that but she didn't actually do that she did bring him up every now and then but it wasn't like suffocating. The main thing in book six is that Lily nominates Mia to be the president, the, the school council president against Mia's wishes as well. Like she doesn't really want to be the uh, school council president, but she ends up going along with it. And I really enjoyed that storyline because it really does feed into Mia and having to be a bit more diplomatic and a bit more assertive, especially when she, like, you know, eventually becomes a princess and she has to rule Genovia. These skills that she learns as school council president could help with that. And this is where I think Princess Diaries thrives. It thrives when it's teenage main character is thrust into this role that she never asked for and that complete fantasy that so many of us had ourselves you know like imagine you know someone coming up to you being like oh you're a princess and you're gonna have to rule a country one day and the pressures of that this is where the series thrives so the fact that Lana also runs against Mia and you do think oh yeah the popular girl's gonna get it and Mia isn't but the way that Mia does her speech at the end. Oh my gosh, I've never been prouder. I've never been prouder of Mia. And this is like one of the rare instances where I feel like Mia was like the least insufferable in any of the books. And I thought, brilliant, like we're going on the right trajectory. She stands up there in front of everyone, nowhere for her to hide. She says that everyone's created equal. Like her speech goes on for like pages. And it's such a good speech. Are you really going to give your consent to the privileged few to make your decisions for you? Or are you going to entrust those decisions to someone who actually understands you, someone who shares your ideals, your hopes, and your dreams, someone who will do her very best to make sure your voice and not the voice of the so-called popular minority is heard. I just love it. I also love the fact that she <laughs> ends the entire speech, like kind of bringing up Sailor Moon and other things to do with like being a geek and being a nerd and how like the jocks and the cheerleaders are actually the minority in the school, not the geeks. So the fact that she ends the speech with, I'm sorry, but as far as I'm concerned, give me anime or give me death. I mean, <laughs> look, it's so dramatic. It's so, give me anime or give me death, you know? It's like, oof. The gym exploded and yeah, she gets a, a standing ovation. This is what wins her the debate. And I love it. Like, yes, a lot of the speech was a little bit juvenile, which uh, is something that I think Mia struggles with. Something that I also think the author struggles with too. I think she doesn't really give Mia and her friends a great enough representation of what a six, like 15, 16, you know, year old is because it seems like she's stuck with a middle school mindset of how these teenagers should act, especially like six, seven, eight books in, and they're still doing a lot of this crap that they do in book one when they're 14. Sometimes that does stunt my enjoyment of this series, but I honestly loved that entire speech. I love that Mia stood up for herself. I love that she stood up for someone else as well. Lana uses an awful word against someone who a lot of people are unsure whether they're a boy or a girl. And so Lana uses this awful word that I'm not gonna say out loud. Mia sticks up for uh, that person. Um, their name was Perrin, and Mia sticks up for them, which was absolutely lovely, honestly. Nice to see Mia do something very selfless. And this is probably like one of the best books for Mia personally, in terms of her development, the way she comes across, very, very good in that regard. And we do still have, you know, those teen issues being brought up that I think a lot of people will relate to. The mentions of doing it is brought up. Lana is the one who kind of starts Mia with the kind of doubt, because obviously Mia isn't doing it with her boyfriend. And we're gonna get into that more in depth in book eight. But the whole concept of feeling self-conscious about your body is something that I think is really explored very well in this. She has these whole paragraphs 
in her diary about having clothes off in front of someone else and how scary that is. That's something that I think a lot of people will relate to no matter what age you are, you know? Like, do not think I'm ready to take my clothes off in front of Michael. I mean, yes, because you're 15 in this, Mia, remember that? But I don't blame Mia too much because, yeah, Lana's got it in her head that she should be doing it. Sometimes Mia's own friends make her think that she should be doing things that she shouldn't actually be doing at that age. So I do think it's important to explore the anxiety of kind of building yourself up before doing it. And I absolutely love the message at the end of this because Michael does... <sighs> Michael does say something in this that really does... Uh, I, I don't understand like how anyone can be on board with me or Michael after like this book in particular. I mean, obviously you shouldn't be in a relationship with her in the first place. She's underage. But I think it's this book where you really start to see more transparently that Michael is problematic to be with Mia, you know? So, I mean, firstly, I want to say, because I, I will get to the message that Mia gets to at the end of this book. I Honestly, if we ended this series here perfection. I do feel like it was important to explore the pressures of sex and having to do that. And Mia does say, Michael expects us to have sex someday. And I'm like, when she's not a minor, maybe. But even then, isn't that grooming? Isn't that grooming? When you're in a relationship with someone who is underage and, you know, you're waiting till they're a little bit older to do that, that's still grooming. That's still disgusting. So it's when Mia and Michael are talking about it and Mia is saying like she's not sure whether or not she wants to do it. And Michael says, well, that's not actually a big surprise to me, Mia. And I went, really? He said, well, you made it fairly obvious where things stood when you invited all your girlfriends and not me over the minute you found out you had a hotel room all to yourself for the weekend. Again, like, she's 15 at this point, Michael. The age of consent is 17, uh, you know, so she's underage. So maybe it's because she's too young. But it's like the next page where he assures Mia that she doesn't have to decide now or anything like that. Like, she, they don't have to do it, like, right now or anything. Mia's, like, starting to feel a bit better about it. She's like, oh, phew, like, that takes the pressure off. Absolutely, Michael said with a smile that was so sweet and made me want to lean over to kiss him. Until he added, but just so you know, Mia... I'm not going to wait around forever. He didn't mean he wasn't going to wait around forever for my answer. Oh no, he meant he wasn't going to wait around forever to do it. Like she's two years from being legal. Two years from being legal. Let that sink in. Two years from being legal in the state of New York. So the conclusion was that all boys want to do it, which again, I think it's very important to explore that. But the whole thing with Michael though, and him being the one to pressure me into wanting to do it and, and stuff like that. That's why we kind of fall out Miss Meg. But what I love about this book in particular is when Mia says after her big speech and she just absolutely killed the debate, she says, but hello, I am the princess of Genovia. I am the newly elected president of the AAHS student council and no one not even Michael is going to tell me when to do it. Yes. Yes. Mia, that was beautiful. That was the best lesson that she could have learned in any book that sticks in her head, at least uh, until book eight. I could not be more proud. Like, I was loving this. At this point in the series, I was like, gosh, why am I doing this? I'm not even halfway through the series yet. I'm just like having a bad time and it's not being entertaining or it's not giving me what I want and I'm, I'm just hating myself right now. But this book changed all of that. And I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to read book seven now. I was like, this is what I want. This is true, genuine growth for me. Oh my God, I was up, I was clapping, I was dancing. I was like, this is amazing, amazing. That's exactly what I want. Also, yeah, at the end of this book, it does show you that Michael is aware that he's too old for her. I knew going into this that it wasn't going to be easy, Mia. I mean, aside from the age difference, unless a man might find all that daunting, I mean, a good man wouldn't be in a relationship with a minor Michael, unless a man might find all that daunting. He's saying this is a challenge. Michael is saying getting Mia, a minor, to do it as a challenge. You're the girl I want. One day you will be mine. That is honestly scary. I can imagine as a teen and you're reading this, this might come across as quite romantic. And I don't blame anyone for coming to that conclusion when you're that age and you're not as like aware of not just the legal ramifications of this relationship, but especially the social climate in the 2000s. It was so different. When I was 14 slash 15, I had crushes on older guys. Like this would have been my dream come true if I was Mia. But what I do not love is that this relationship is later romanticized and it's said to be okay. But not just that, but how brainwashed 
a lot of the people I've seen review this series are, and I'm not judging you guys as well. If you're watching this and you do root for me and Michael, I'm not judging you, but I am genuinely flabbergasted that people root for a relationship between a minor and somebody who has essentially groomed her. That is why I am confused. If I was gonna give this a rating, I'm not rating any of the books anymore because it's just, I, I feel like it's not gonna be pleasant. But if I did have to give this book a rating, I'd give it a three out of five. Like I genuinely thought a lot of this was very, very good. I had a good story. I loved Mia Rennan for class president. She's away from Michael for the majority of this book too, which was perfection to me. Mia's friends weren't as terrible. Lily wasn't as terrible in this book. It felt like we were going on the right track. And to be honest, we stay on the right track because book seven is still pretty good. I love the way book seven starts. So Mia is writing to this person who is dead, but he's the author of this kind of journal about self-actualization. I was gonna do a drinking game where I drank every single time Mia or anyone mentioned self-actualization, but I didn't want to die by the time I got this blog out. But she is writing to Dr. Jung. She is, you know, wanting tips on how to self-actualize, but I love how this starts. So it's, Dear Dr. Carl Jung, I realize that you will never read this letter primarily because you are dead. I'm like, that is actually a fantastic opening line for a book. I was like, damn, this is great. And every now and then we do get Mia writing to this dead person, trying to get advice about self-actualization and what it means and like how to get it. And I found those little excerpts so good. I really enjoyed those. And we do carry over the student council plotline from the sixth book. Mia is now the president of the school council and the school council is broke. And they need to try and figure out a way to raise money, like $5,000 in order to get the things that they promised and you know keep the school afloat essentially. And that kind of storyline I much prefer over an entire book like book five of Mia just obsessing over a prom that isn't hers. You know what I mean? This is something that lends into things that will come in useful later. It's given Mia the skills to be a princess. Being student council, she's accepting responsibility. She is trying to rally the people together to try and raise money and all of this, that and the other. And I love that kind of storyline because yeah, it does lend into her later being a princess and all the responsibilities for that. She even accepts responsibility very early on. She says, if there's one thing I've learned from this princess business, it's that with sovereignty comes responsibility. You can delegate all you want, but ultimately you're the one who is going to pay the price if something goes awry. I should have been paying attention. I should have been more on top of things. She actually takes responsibility for all of this. Yeah, she blames herself. She doesn't blame anyone else for the school being broke and stuff like that. She blames herself. And I was like, this is huge. This is monumental for Mia's progression. We also have the storyline of Gramia, AKA Clarice, wanting to buy an island. And there is a rival bidder of this island and the bidder, his son, goes to Mia's school. And we have this guy who's introduced who likes to pick out the corn from his chili and Mia and her friends kind of make fun of him in secret, which is, again, mean though. That is very mean. Mia is all for standing up for the bullied every now and then. She is bullied a lot of the times, but she does bully other people, but a little bit more secretly than the others. And the guy who picks out the corn turns out to be well, he's called JP, and he is the son of the rival bidder. So Gramia has this whole plan concocted of her making this musical called Braid and getting people to audition from the school in order to, one, not only just help Mia raise the money, the $5,000, to help the school, but to also get that island. <laughs> it's honestly a messy storyline, but it was kind of fun to follow along with. Again, like Gramia, Clarice isn't a great person, she does blackmail Amelia quite a lot. I mean, Julie Andrews would never blackmail Mia, but Clarice in the books, she absolutely will. She does it pretty much every book she blackmails her. And while all of this is going on, and you can really see the pressure is really starting to uh, get on top of Mia's shoulders, but Lily wants to run a student-led literary magazine, one that they can sell in school so that they can also raise money for this school fund. But Mia has written a short story where the guy who picks out the, the corn from the chili JP, she wrote a poem about him without him knowing, or like some kind of short story, where JP ends up unaliving himself at the end of it, and Mia doesn't want him to read that. Because it's really weird to write a story about somebody who is bullied by pretty much everyone else, who you secretly bully, to write a story where they unalive themselves at the end of it. What? You know what I mean? Like, me, oh. So she obviously doesn't want him to read it. Lily does end up printing that story, which Mia doesn't really... It's a bit weird. I feel like it's a little bit shoehorned in by the end of this. The magazine gets published. Mia tries to destroy them. JP ends up helping her 
Uh, but then Mia kind of backs out. She doesn't want to destroy them because it was Lily's hard work. But then the magazine gets pulled anyway because Lily put some R-rated stories in there, like filled with sex and all of this, that, and the other. The magazine gets pulled anyway and changed. And also the name of this magazine was stupid. What was it called again? Like Fat Louie's Pink Butthole or something? Yeah, Fat Louie's Pink Butthole. And they're getting people to submit their stories to this magazine. Which again, I think is kind of a cool storyline, but again, like a lot of the humor is very juvenile. Maybe a little bit too young for a book that's seven books into a series where the characters are now 15 and we're exploring topics of the pressures of having sex at that age and stuff like that. You know, sometimes the humor can be very contradictory to the tone that we're trying to go for as well. Michael isn't a huge part of this, thank God. Oh my God, I just remembered as well, actually, I came across this. Lily does this entire essay, this entire list of women who are too beautiful to live. She lists them all and why they shouldn't be alive because they're too beautiful. Paris Hilton's on this list, Angelina Jolie, Kira Knightley, Jessica Alba, Halle Berry, Natalie Portman, Shannon Sossaman, Thandie Newton, Nicole Kidman, Penelope Cruz. For Mia and Lily being people who are so severely bullied and belittled and their appearances are always criticized and stuff like that, having lists like this that Lily makes, and you know, Mia is just as culpable for lists like this, it's honestly so awful to read. Kira Knightley, oh my god, I hate her, she's way too beautiful to live. Natalie Portman, it doesn't matter how many colours you dye your hair, Miss Portman, we still think you're too pretty to live. Let's move on. Michael also invites Mia to a party. She thinks Michael's changed and that he's becoming a bit of a party animal and Mia isn't a party girl. But she goes to this party. She ends up like sexy dancing with JP as well. She also admits that there is some under the shirt and over the bra action going on with uh, Michael as well, jail. But there is like kind of a, a I guess a spark between JP and Mia. And at least JP is Mia's age, you know? At least they are kind of right for each other. They don't get together in this book or anything. In fact, it gets very, very messy in book eight. But I could kind of get a feeling or a sense that JP had something for Mia, and Mia was quite oblivious to that. But JP gets cast as the main lead in Braid, the musical that Clarice has written, and Mia gets the main female lead in that musical. And JP and Mia have to kiss at the end of this musical, except Michael manages to somehow get on stage and kiss her instead kind of thing. It's kind of weird, it's kind of odd, but I did like the whole musical side of this book. Despite Grand Mia blackmailing Mia to be the lead, even though Mia doesn't want to be the lead, she doesn't really want anything to do with this musical. She's got too much going on as it is. And Grand Mia is threatening to tell someone called Amber about how Mia squandered the money for her commencement ceremony on recycling bins. Grand Mia, you wouldn't. Her reply rocked me to my very core, or oh, I would. I will, of course, say nothing to your little friend about the state of the class treasury, but in return, you will have to solve my current real estate crisis by starring in Braid. I'm just flabbergasted at the way she goes on. And sometimes I think Mia goes over the top and she says how much she hates her grandmother. But there are moments like this where Grandmia does actually blackmail her granddaughter. I don't fully love the fact that Mia hates her so much, but I can kind of see why she does. Clarice is just awful. Take a shot every single time I say that. Even at the end, too, she gives Mia the $5,000 for the school and she says the Genovian farmers will never know what's missing. So like Clarice has just admitted that she's stolen this money from her own people. You know what, that checks. So when it comes down to the actual story of book seven, I do really enjoy it. And I honestly would have given this like maybe a 2.5 out of five stars if I was reading them. I don't think I liked it as much as book six because I think the message that Mia learned in book six was so great and the way she came across as was so great. And don't get me wrong, Mia does come to some great lessons in this too. She says, uh, made me realize there and then there that being in a mature relationship has nothing to do with drinking beer and dancing sexy. Because yeah, those pressures, that she felt from Michael about like coming to this party, being a party girl, drinking beer and stuff. She realizes that's not good. Instead, it's everything to do with being able to count on someone not to break up with you just because you danced with another guy at a party one night or not to take it personally when you can't call them as often as you'd like because you're super busy dealing with midterms and a family crisis. Oh yeah, because Michael and Lily's parents are breaking up too. But like the insecurities within a relationship, I mean, again, I don't want her to be in a relationship with Michael whatsoever, but like the insecurities that Mia was feeling, she realizes at the end of the book to not be so insecure or overthink these relationships, which I know is hard to do. So I kind of do feel proud of her for the majority of this. So book six and seven honestly did restore my faith quite a bit in the Princess Diary series. I was like, right, yes, we are on track. I mean, still questionable things, but not outwardly terrible. But don't get me started on book 
8. So the current state of affairs right now with Book 8 is that we have skipped ahead to another school year, like the start of new school year. I'm talking like we've skipped months and months and months. We've skipped Mia's 16th birthday, which I'm really surprised at because on like Sweet 16's quite important, like isn't that something that a lot of people celebrate and stuff? I did not celebrate my Sweet 16. I believe I did have a birthday. I mean, obviously I had a birthday, but I, I mean, I don't think I celebrated it as, you know, intensely as a lot of people do. But this is the current state of affairs. Mia is 16, she's now a junior which means she has another year before she's a senior, and Michael is now 19, going on 20. And just let that sink in. So in this one, we have Mia writing creative assignments to her teacher, Miss Martinez. Well, actually, there's two recurring things in this. Mia writing a, a screenplay about her life called Me, a Princess, yeah, right. So she's writing a screenplay for that, so we get little excerpts of that, which is kind of cool. And then we also get little creative writing things to do with prompt that Miss Martinez gives her. And I ended up grading Mia myself for each one. I think it was only like three. The first one, Miss Martinez gives her a C minus because she was supposed to describe a room and she didn't really do that. I would give it an F. It was really shit. And later she has to describe a scene outside her window, which Martinez gives her an F minus. I also give it an F minus. And the last one was an assignment to describe a beloved pet, but Mia ends up giving her an excerpt from her screenplay where she actually turns out to be a highly trained demon killer for the Vatican. And yeah, Miss Martinez gives it an F and I give it a Z because it was really shit. Anyway, this is gonna be a really hard one to talk about because I feel like this is gonna end up being a public service announcement on this whole Michael and Mia relationship. In this one, we have Michael telling Mia that he is going to go to Japan. He's gonna to move to Japan for a bit to work on this robotic thing that could save a lot of lives. I had to document my reading experience of this book on my Instagram stories because I could not believe my eyes of what I was reading in this book. Honestly, my flabbers have never been so gasted in all of its life. So Michael is moving to Japan for a year or more. He leaves Friday. And honestly, I was so happy because actually the first like 39 pages of this book, I was like, this series is so good. Like I'm loving this again. Book six was great. Book seven was great. This one's gonna be great too, right? Right? And to be fair, me, I just come across as very selfish because where Michael says, oh, I'm going over there for a year to develop this thing that could save thousands of lives. Mia's like, shut up, shut up, shut up. Is it because of me? Are you moving to Japan because I did something or didn't do something? And then she goes on this whole spiel about like, why would any guy who loves his girlfriend as much as Michael claimed to love me want to be part from me for a year? Yes, I understand that his robotic arm thingy could save thousands of lives, but what about my life? I can't hug him from the rest of the world, which really does need him and his genius, except, except what am I going to do if I can't smell his neck? I might die. So she does have this like weird neck fetish thing that goes on in these books too. Yes, like Mia is coming across as very selfish, but again, she is in a relationship with someone who is too old for her and she is a minor. So while she is annoying, at least she isn't committing a crime. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then we get to the conversation between them after this moment. And this is where like, I literally find it so unacceptable to even have this be a relationship in this series. So Michael is saying, I'm not sure how much longer I'll be able to deal with it. Deal with what? Because I had no idea what he was talking about. And he said, being with you all the time and not you know. And Michael finally just had to say, not having sex. Read my notes. Read my notes. She is a minor. But then he says, the fact remains that your senior prom isn't for two more years, and two years is a long time for us to keep, well, doing what we're doing. I'm getting really tired of taking so many cold showers. Again, again, she is a minor. She is a minor. It's not easy, Mia. I mean, it seems like it's easy for you. Shut up. Shut up, Michael. And like, how many guys in general say this to their girlfriends thinking, that it's easier for the girls to not have sex with them. This whole idea of like blue balls and things like that, I'm like, it's just an excuse for guys to guilt girls into having sex with them. This is all Michael is doing in this moment. He's trying to guilt Mia into having sex with him, or at least make her feel guilty that she hasn't had sex with him yet. And let us remember, say it with me, she is a minor. And not a minor as in somebody who, you know, minds but like a mino, 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 M-I-N-O-R. And he's saying about like moving to Japan, this is a good thing, Mia, not just for me, but for us. It's my chance to prove to your grandmother and all those people who think I'm a big nobody and not good enough for you that I actually am somebody and might possibly even be worthy of you someday. I, it's just a big no 
for me because this is coming across as trying to romanticize the relationship again. This is Michael going off to prove himself to Mia's family and hoping that he will one day, you know, take her for his wife and be worthy of her. But at this point, it's just groomed. Oh, don't get me started with the racism about Japan, like talking about geisha girls. Well, Mia says, geisha girls have sex with you whenever you want. I know I saw that movie. And Michael's like, well, actually, now that you mentioned it, a geisha girl might not be so bad. The racism, the stereotypes in Tina, don't get me started on Tina. She is like probably the most innocent character, I guess. But the way that she always tries to romanticize these relationships too, she says the whole thing is so romantic, Michael is just like Aragorn from The Lord of the Rings, like trying to prove himself. She said the same kind of thing about it being romantic. Oh gosh, like a few books back, I feel like I did mention it in this vlog, but I've mentioned so many things at this point, I'm like frazzled. But Tina, I don't care about any of that stuff, Tina. I mean, I want him to be happy and all, but I would be happy if he just stayed here so I could smell his neck every day. Do you know what I mean about things coming across as very juvenile? The fact that Mia is saying things like this is surely showing you that she is too young to be in a relationship with a 19 year old going on 20. The whole eight diaries that I've kind of read so far surely proves that she hasn't developed to maturity yet. She is still growing. She is still too young to be in a kind of relationship with a guy who's pressuring her to have sex. They're talking about touching penises. Mia gets this fascination because, oh, Lily is now dating JP, but JP doesn't love Lily. In fact, he's only dating Lily because he actually really likes Mia instead. Very messy. But Mia's like, you have to tell me if you and JP did it over the summer. I don't know why it's so interesting to me, but I mean, if my best friend has had sex, I think I should be allowed to hear about it in detail. It's so weird. I don't even think it's told in a way that is like informative enough for the readers of this series, the target audience. Because if anything, it's just romanticizing the idea of doing it at 15. Mia is still torn about doing it. She is like so overcome with anxiety to the point where she pretty much has panic attacks about the prospect of doing it. You're only 16, cut yourself some slack. But Michael's only 19. Only? He's gonna turn 20 before she turns 17. And it seems like Gramia is encouraging this behavior because Gramia has given me her suite at the Ritz for sex. My grandmother has given me my own sex place. She does give me a, a hotel room, essentially, after hearing everything. And it, honestly, Gramia doesn't like Michael or anything. Like she doesn't like him, she calls him that boy. So it's kind of a bit vague a bit later on where you think, oh, maybe Gramia didn't give Mia the key for that. But that whole thing is never wrapped up. You're actually never told exactly why Gramia gave her a hotel key after hearing about Mia's problems so that she could have her own place. Well, I can't do it with Michael because, you know, Lars is my bodyguard and like, what would we do it at his dorm room? Or like, would we do it at my home where my parents are? And I'm just like, Oh God, this whole conversation is so uncomfortable. And then Mia as well. And this is where I'm getting like really concerned, not just about like Mia in general, but like the reviewers of this book, because I've been on Goodreads, I've looked at the reviews of this book, and I'm wondering how people have come away from this book to see Mia as the problem in this. I hate Mia Thermopolis Club, population me. Mia was overreacting over what happened with Michael. I understand where Mia's coming from. Michael should have been up front. Oh yeah, because Michael, there's this whole thing, I'm gonna be all over the place with this. There's this whole thing about giving up your precious gift, your virginity. And Michael's already done it with Judith, I believe her name was, the person who was in like book two, I wanna say. And Judith was in a relationship at the time, she did have a boyfriend. So Michael and Judith did, he lost his virginity to Judith while she was in a relationship. So like, that's obviously terrible. There was some cheating going on there. And Mia is mortified at that. She's like, I thought we were gonna lose our virginity together. She had no idea that Michael had slept with someone before the relationship started. And she keeps telling him, you lied to me, you lied to me. You said you weren't going out. And he was like, yeah, we weren't going out. We just had sex. Mia does have this whole rant and stuff about it all. Michael didn't disclose his sexual history because Mia never asked, but still like considering Mia is only 15 years old, and you're not gonna tell her that you've had sex in the past. I do feel like that is weird also. So why are people coming out of this thinking that Mia is the one who overreacted? Someone is saying, yeah, they end this review by saying, I love Michael. I wasn't Mia's biggest fan during this read. The bad Mia, she continuously drives me crazy in these books, but this one really took the cake. She self centered mean to all her friends and Michael, whom she claims to love and just downright illogical. She went from being a sort of ditzy, but well-meaning princess in training in the first book to someone who actively does damage because she simply can't comprehend that her actions have consequences. I am pretty sick of Mia, but I can't stop reading the books. Mia is sometimes so annoying still of the series. I'm so done with Mia right now. She is the worst. Michael and Mia broke up, which sucks. They do end up breaking up, by the way. But the fact that they think it sucks that they broke up, I mean, 
Mia is so annoying. I'm tired of the my boyfriend of my entire life whining. I mean, same. Oh, I'm also glad that he also said Michael is the worst boyfriend ever. That is true. That is very true. Mia is at the same maturity level as a 12 year old, which I would kind of agree with that. Which is why she shouldn't be in a relationship with a guy who's older than her, who's pressured on her to have sex. Uh, there is this moment in uh, this book where Mia says, what if, just what if, Michael and I had sex and Grammy has a man in suite at the Ritz and he liked it so much he decided not to go after all. Wouldn't that be worth compromising my feminist principles? Wouldn't it actually be more feminist? Because by keeping Michael around, I will be able to smell his neck and therefore release serotonin into my brain on a regular basis, making me a calmer and more well-rounded individual and a better student leader and role model to young girls everywhere. So Mia does have this plan where she is going to manipulate Michael into staying by giving him her precious gift, her virginity. The only funny thing about the whole precious gift thing is that Grammya does get the wrong idea, at, like towards the end of this book, where she's like, precious gift, what? And he already gave it to someone else? You know, like she thinks that it's an actual object, like some kind of family heirloom, which was funny. Like one of the only funny things in this book. But this is where, this is where people are totally missing the whole point that what Michael and Mia are doing is, is illegal. The author herself is telling you it's illegal on page 96. And I know that technically Michael and I making love is illegal since at 16, I'm still one year away from the age of consent in the state of New York, but I don't care. I don't care. So does every single person who roots for Mia and Michael, they also don't care that this is illegal? Again, I'm not trying to pass judgment to anyone who roots for them, but I'm also not not doing that. I mean, this might get me a lot of hate, but at this moment in time, where the author explicitly says what they're doing is illegal, that a minor is in a relationship with an older guy pressuring her to have sex, and still Mia is the one who comes out of this book looking bad? Yes, her trying to use sex to manipulate is bad, but let's remember here, she's a 16-year-old girl. She has no good influence in her life. Like, her mum, terrible with advice. Her dad, encouraging the behaviour. Her grandmother, self-centered, not gonna give her any decent advice. In fact, she gave her a fucking abandoned hotel room to have sex in. Her friends think it's romantic. Who does Mia have who is a genuinely good role model in her life? The media are just as bad. The media is terrible, giving a teenage girl these awful ideas. I mean, I can imagine reading this younger and seeing the fantasy side of this. I absolutely do, because again, I have had crushes on all the guys when I was 14, 15, 16. Never been in a relationship with one, and if I had been, I would have hoped that the people around me told me that that was unacceptable. And the person who was 18, 19, going on 20 would be jailed. But reading these reviews on Goodreads from people who are adults from the past five, six, seven years, and it's explicitly stated in this book that it's illegal. And Mia is the one who's coming out this as the worst. The 16 year old, the one who hasn't developed fully yet. She's the one who comes out the worst. Like, I'm not a Mia defender. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a Mia defender. I do find her insufferable. But again, she is a teenager. She is supposed to be that way half the time. And while I do think Meg really does take two steps forward, five steps back with Mia's development, she is still underage. She is still a minor. She is still a teenager. I didn't think we would ever get to this point where I would defend Mia like this. But I can't get on board. I can't, I can't do it. I can't, in good conscience, root for a romance that is rooted in grooming. Anyway, Mia just decided that she's gonna do it tonight. I was up all night thinking about it and I now know this is the only way. The fact, where's the empathy? I, I feel sad for Mia. I feel bad for her that she has been pressured so much by her boyfriend, by her friends, by society, that the only way to keep a guy is to give up your virginity to him. I feel sad that Mia thinks this. I feel so empathetic to her dilemma right now she feels like this is the only option to cling on to someone who she thinks she loves. That isn't Mia's fault. I'm gonna be the first person to say it. That is not Mia's fault. Gonna try and control him with sex. I'm sacrificing my virginity in order to keep a valuable asset of our community from leaving it for a far off show. In the long run, my seeping with Michael tonight will only benefit the US economy. You could almost say it's my duty as a citizen to do it. Obviously that's terrible, but we know we're talking about Mia here. Honestly, I understand the anxiety of giving up your virginity. I understand the pressures of that, and I would have loved a more nuanced exploration of that in a book that is so influential to a lot of teenagers who read this. I honestly wish it wasn't romanticizing abuse of a minor. That is essentially what this boils down to. She's literally screaming out, who am I fooling? I can't do this. I cannot do this. I can't have sex. 
and the princess are crying out loud, oh my god, I think I'm having a heart attack. My heart breaks for her, it really does. I know she's not doing the best things, but she is so young. She is so young. And I feel bad that she even feels like this is an option. She is freaking out. She's having a full on panic attack. Then there is stuff about the age of consent. Whatever. Like my dad would really press charges. Would he want the whole world to know his daughter had premarital sex? It's not exactly about the fact that it's premarital, it's the fact that she's a minor. One of the cons about sleeping with uh, Michael, the fact that I'm not yet 18 could lead to legal complications for Michael down the road. Although I'm sure my dad wouldn't want the tabloids to find out about something like that. It's been mentioned quite a few times in this book now about the age of consent, about it being illegal. And this is where we put a stop to it. This is where we stop having this relationship. Mia and Michael do break up at the end of this book, which is great. That is awesome. That's amazing. They should not be in a relationship. But I know for a fact that in book 11, The Princess Diaries Wedding, she gets married to him and they have children. She marries her groomer. If we left it at her and Michael breaking up, if we left it at that, I would have felt pretty okay about it. Because as long as we learn from this whole situation that it's not okay to romanticize a relationship with a minor, then great, let's not romanticize it. But we end up having Mia get married to him. And I can't in good conscience read book 11 because of that. And therefore I probably won't read book 12. Honestly, I'm shocked. I'm honestly shocked. I went on to Goodreads to see what other people have been saying about it. And I am just as shocked with people reading this, thinking that Mia is worse than Michael over this. Are people actually okay? Anyway, Mia and Michael have this hotel room and Mia mentions, I know your robotic surgical arm is important, but I think we're more important. Our love is more important. And I think giving each other the precious gift of our virginity would be the most powerful expression of our love ever. That's when she finds out Michael gave his gift away, his precious gift, gave it away a long time ago. The fact that she's calling a precious gift again is showing her immaturity. You have had sex before and you didn't think that was a big deal? A big enough deal to tell your girlfriend? Like you should have told her by now. Especially if he's pressuring her to have sex, he should at least be like, yeah, I've had sex before. Like long before this. You told me she had a boyfriend and she did. Like Michael, what? How do people root for Michael after this? Even if he was the same age as Mia, the fact that he knowingly slept with someone who had a boyfriend at the time, he is not a good person. Also, little side note, Mia gives up her vegetarianism for cheeseburgers in this book, just so I let you know. But what Lily says about virginity and the precious gift thing is so true. Like she says, it's crap. Start off as men's way of controlling females so that they can limit their number of sexual partners and therefore ensure the legitimacy of their own offspring. I do agree with the whole like virginity side of things. Like it is just a construct. We shouldn't be listening to it. So sometimes I agree with Liddy, but she comes across as so mean and mean spirited. I do feel bad for Lily at the end of this because her and JP do break up. JP tells her he doesn't love her and stuff. And she kind of knew that he never loved her, but she wanted to like still be in this relationship with him. And what's really, really weird is that at the end of the book, and you can honestly tell, you can so tell that JP likes Mia. I would definitely prefer Mia and JP to be together than Michael and Mia. We do have this really high school drama thing happen where Michael comes to her high school. And again, imagine you're 19, nearly 20, going to someone's high school, going to your girlfriend's high school where she is a junior. JP ends up kissing Mia on the lips and Mia says, I only meant to kiss him on the cheek, but he moved his head. And so I ended up kissing him on the lips. And this was right after Lily and JP broke up. So it looks like they've kissed and like they're getting together, which Lily is obviously devastated by. So I totally get that even if Lily is a terrible friend sometimes. But Mia has this whole performance where she realizes that she is in the wrong, well, she's not in the wrong. I don't think she's in the wrong, but she thinks she's in the wrong. So she tries to get to the airport so that she can stop Michael boarding this plane and tell him that she is sorry and that she didn't mean to kiss JP, like it was an accident, but he's already gone. He's already flown off. So I was like, oh, and I did like the fact that Mia's dad still loves Mia's mum because I had a feeling that he did. But I, I, that's just like a nice little thing. I, I like that. She is too late to stop him. And she ends up getting a quarter pounder with cheese and goes home. Lily berates her for kissing her boyfriend. Lily is now also the newly elected school council president. And then JP rings saying that he has two box seats tickets to tonight's Broadway performance of Beauty and the Beast, which is Mia's favorite musical. So she ends up going to see Beauty and the Beast at the very end of this with JP. So after everything that's happened, oh, I, I knew at this moment in time, I can only stomach nine and 10.
I can only stomach these books. After knowing what happens in book 11, I, I can't read it. I can't read it. I can't read a book where she marries her groomer. I can't do that. But book 9 and 10, the original end of the series, you can even see it's here, the final book in the number one bestselling series. This was supposed to be the last book. And so I'm going to treat it as the last book. I'm not reading book 11 and 12. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it myself. I love myself too much to do it. So I am sorry. I did want to be overly negative and I did think after reading book six and seven that we had improved, that things were on the up, that things were changing. And then knowing that Megan was moving to Japan, I thought, oh my God, this is perfection. But after everything else in this book and knowing what happens in book 11, I can't do it. Two more books instead of four to go now. Yay! We're live! We're live for some Princess Diaries action. We are having a royal night in. A royal night in and it's going to be a royally good time. I'm getting ready to get settled in and watch The Princess Diaries 1 and 2. Oh my gosh. And yeah, Emma, same. It's been such a long time since I watched these films. I... I love them so much. I can't even remember the last time I watched them, though. Okay, I want to say this out loud, but I've forgotten how to pronounce... Is it Mignot? Min Mignot? Mignot? I've forgotten how to pronounce it because it's been that long since I've seen the films. I forgot how to pronounce that name. How bad is that? I've got my handbag cocktail. I'm so excited. This is Cranberry Martini. Oh, I haven't even tried it yet, but I hope it's good. Like, I feel like this is perfect for the Princess Diaries movie night. I really do hope it's... I, you know what? I can try it on camera. That's really classy of me. I also got some Reese's Pieces cupcakes, as well as cream eggs. I love cream eggs. But also, I do still have my popcorn, my massive tub of popcorn. Should I quickly taste test this before I continue with comments? Oh, it's got something on it and I don't know how to take it off. <gasps> oh no, what do I do? I might need a, a knife or... Oh wait, no, 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 no. I think I might have it. Oh, like, so do I just like drink it out the handbag like this? Like, is it just... Is that classy? Is that princess-like? Would Julie Andrews be mortified with me if I just drink it straight out of the bag? Let's try it. Oh, that's strong. Oh. Um, hmm. I mean, it's all right. Pre-mixed vodka-based cocktail drink. So it is pre-mixed. It's cranberry flavor with a hint of blood orange and lime. Oh, shake the bottle. Oh, I didn't do that. I didn't shake it. That might be why. Shake the bottle to evenly mix. And then pour into a shaker with ice. I think I will just drink it straight out of the bag. I'm a princess. I do what I want. We're going to start. I'm going to count us down in five, four, three, two, one. Play. Thank you for being here today. I don't have to do that all the time now. The more I drink of this, the more awful it is. Like, it tastes absolutely vile. Gupta? Mm-hmm. 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 The Queen is coming. Oh, crowning glory, the most glorious part of you and you and you and you. Pause that film. Pause it good. Pause this film just like you should, manic. Mabek. That's what I would probably sing if I was in Genovia. Screw the national anthem. I'm singing a bit of my neck, my back in front of Queen Clarice. Or should I say Queen Clitorice? <laughs> 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 okay, I didn't realize this <laughs> until right now, but I think I put on the same hoodie as I had on at the start of the video, which honestly, to be fair, that is kind of a full circle moment. And this has been watched since then. I've been reading these books for the past three weeks, okay? But I have finished two more Princess Diaries books, the ninth and 10th book, and these are the last two books that I will be reading. So talking about book nine first, I know I just did an update for book eight, 
where I was very scathing. It was a very bad negative review. I had a lot of problems with that book as well as like the series in general, but don't think I'm just gonna be negative, negative, negative. I would, if I rated the Princess Diaries books, give this four stars. This one is probably my favorite book in the series. And it was actually good. All we needed to do was to get rid of Mia's predator boyfriend, Michael, and ship him off to a different country and keep him there for the entirety of the book. So not having Michael in this book really did help. And it isn't even just about Michael in why I actually like this book the most, but the development of Mia in this book was so big and she made so many smart, mature choices. In this, I was Ooh, I was so proud. And then I was, you know, a little bit wary because she's done this song and dance before. She's made progress and then she's went back to her old ways and this, that, and the other. And while I have read book 10 and there are some things that, again, like we do regress with, I will say though that this book on its own was probably the best in the series. And it was so interesting as well because there was a website that just came out of nowhere called IHateMeAtTheMobilist.com, which was so mean, but I kind of knew exactly who was running it from the beginning. I kind of knew because at the end of book eight, Lily and Mia had fallen out and, oh, Lily is awful in this book. She really, really is. And while I try to play devil's advocate and be like, oh, you know, I can kind of say from Lily's perspective, you know, Mia did get with JP, who was Lily's boyfriend, literally as soon as they'd broken up. And the fact that, and like Mia doesn't know this at the time, but the fact that JP does have the big crush on Mia and was only going out with Lily so that he could get closer to Mia. And then as soon as Mia became available, dump Lily so he could be with her. And obviously like all of these things don't look good, right? They don't look good. But the way that Lily acts in this book is so awful and so mean. Even just making a hate website towards somebody who she called a best friend for her entire life. Uh, I mean, I know Mia and Michael had broken up and obviously Michael was gonna be upset about it and Lily was gonna side with Michael a bit because they are blood related. I can understand that one. But at the same time, just making this website. And when Mia comes to Lily later on in the book too, asking for help for something, Lily shouts at Mia in front of everyone in this uh, like dining hall where they're having food. She shouts, I mean, I've just skipped way ahead on this one, but like she shouts in front of everyone. I cannot believe this Lily yell, literally yelled at me even though I was sitting right across from her belly two feet away. You're completely unbelievable. First you break my brother's heart and you steal my boyfriend. Then you think you can ask me for advice about your completely dysfunctional family. Nothing is ever your fault, is it, Mia? Why should you ever admit you were in the wrong when the victim thing is working so well for you, right? There are some truths to what Lily says sometimes, but the way she comes across, the way she doesn't even let Mia speak, the way she doesn't even consider what Mia is going through and like the vulnerability of Mia at this time and like everything that's going on top of Mia, like Lily doesn't listen. Lily doesn't listen to her. She doesn't even ask. She doesn't even stop for one second and be like, okay, Mia, you've been my best friend for so long. Why are you with JP? Why did you go and say Beauty and the Beast with JP literally the minute Michael got on that plane? Mia was in such a vulnerable state. Like, why doesn't Lily just like sit and listen for a second? Perhaps you've seen it. If not, let me give you the URL. It's I hate me at the I guess I always knew it, but to hear her admit it like that so proudly, like she wanted me to know, I'm like, that's just like a step too far to create this toxic place online that is going to drag down the 16 year old girl again me as only 16 in this book and i'm just like oh if one of my friends ever did that to me we would never ever be friends again like i know mia and lily in book 10 there are something i will i will talk about book 10 and everything there but like this would be in the point where i would have been like okay me and lily are never gonna be friends again she hasn't listened to a word i said she doesn't know how vulnerable I was when, you know, JP asked to take her to Beauty and the Beast. Obviously she was in a vulnerable state, she was upset. So obviously she wanted to do something that would make her happy and that's what made her happy. And obviously the JP stuff kind of just snowballed. Like you see how much it snowballs. JP acts like such a gentleman and I was a little bit suspicious of him in this book and some of my suspicions were correct in book 10. But like he acts on paper like so romantic, so understanding, so caring, and like he is a perfect match for Mia really. So you can tell like Mia is very, she doesn't know what to do half the time, but she is in a vulnerable state. That's the key word here. She is vulnerable and she is young. So a little bit of understanding from Mia's best friend would have just gone such a long way and things never would have gotten out of hand the way it does between the two. Anyway, yeah, the whole Lily stuff was so awful in this book. I would have dropped her 
like that. Obviously Mia doesn't handle every situation very well either. Mia, actually this is amazing for Mia, she ends up going to therapy. Like she starts therapy in this book and honestly it was the best decision. I mean it wasn't her decision to begin with, it was her dad. Her dad, after Mia has missed school for four days, after her and Michael have decided that they would just be friends, and she goes in this like downward spiral, Mia realizes that she is depressed. And honestly, like that itself is such a huge and amazing thing to explore in a teen book series. Like you have no idea how monumental that is for young teens to read about, kind of like really positive things to do with mental health. Because I mean, when I was a teen, like 20 years ago, <laughs> I'm selling myself short here. I was a teenager. The last time I was a teenager was 2012. So that was only 12 years ago, <laughs> okay? But even when I was a teen and all the things I was going through, there wasn't really any discussions on mental health and depression. Like none of that was ever discussed at school. Actually, this was written and published while I was a teenager. So really the fact that this book did that during that time is actually quite amazing to me. And I will give it huge props for that. But yeah, therapy and mental health was a little bit taboo, I guess, and just not discussed. So to see Mia actually make such amazing progress with her mental health in this book and the way that she is able to kind of move on from Michael a little bit and see, I mean, I don't know if Mia totally understands just how dangerous being with Michael was. I mean, not just in the whole legal ramification sense of it, but how obsessed Mia became with him, that it was really unhealthy. You can't read the Princess Diary series and think that Mia's fatuation with Michael was healthy, because that wasn't healthy. The way it seems her mental state was tied into the relationship with Michael, and how I would probably say 80% of the Princess Diary series was actually about Michael. You can't say that the way she acted, the way that her feelings had developed over time was healthy, because it wasn't. And you can see exactly how that progresses in book nine, and the way that she has to go to therapy and has to sort through her issues and deal with it head on, that you realize, yeah, all of that was unhealthy. Mia needs to move on. And actually there was a really amazing quote in this because JP does say to her, hey, like, do you wanna go out and stuff? And she's like, not ready. And she says to him, I think I need more time to figure out who I am without him, Michael, before I start going out with somebody else. I need to get my head straightened out before I can let anybody else into it. Does that make sense? Like that is so mature and like such a huge deal that I honestly, stand an ovation for Mia yet again. And I honestly wish that the author had have carried that on. Like I really wish in book nine and 10, we just dealt with Mia being on her own, discovering who she is by herself without being in a relationship. Because yeah, she does end up getting with JP, which is a more age appropriate relationship. And while Mia isn't head over heels in love with JP like she was with Michael, at least it's one legal. And two, he does seem like a nice person. And have you seen the second Princess Diaries film where Mia has to choose between Andrew and Nicholas? Andrew is the like prince who is the more on paper, the right option for her, like the safe option for her. That feels like JP. So Mia's heart isn't even in it with JP anyway. So I honestly wish that Mia had just stayed single, just dealt with her own issues herself and discovered who she was without guys. I think that would have been a much better way of ending this series and I think a lot more empowering for girls reading this or anyone reading this, honestly, to feel like the number one priority in any relationship is yourself and your own mental health, your own self-worth and how your self-worth is not tied to someone else. I would have loved if that's the route we went, but unfortunately not. Which is why I kind of wish that we ended with book nine, because even though she does get with JP by the end of this, we could have just ended that. I would have filled in the rest with my own imagination later on. And I've realized that Tina is actually a really bad friend for Mia because she tells Mia what she wants to hear, not what she needs to hear. In the way that Tina thinks everything is romantic, even like really problematic things, she'll still say, oh, that's so romantic. And she'll honestly change her tune so many times. And this book she says, oh, well, you know, Michael was too old for you. So maybe this is for the best. And then book 10, she's literally forcing Mia and Michael together. So Tina is, I mean, she's a nice girl, but she is a terrible friend, really. And I feel bad for saying that because I thought Tina was the least problematic of the bunch at this point. But no, honestly, I think there's nothing worse than toxic positivity sometimes. And the way that Tina, like Mia hasn't surrounded herself by friends who are genuinely good for her. But at the same time, she doesn't really have a family that's good for her either. So 
it is what it is, you know, like she has to be the best for what she's got, but I don't blame Mia too much for her own actions. She also ends up becoming friends with Lana in this. I was actually really suspicious of Lana because Lana has been her bully for like eight books and now she changes her tune. Mia is doing a speech at this convention for the Society for Women and it's like really influential and powerful and Lana's mum has asked Mia to be part of it and give a speech and Mia's agreed. So Lana is like now nice to Mia about it all and I was a little bit suspicious at first but after reading book 10 like there's nothing to be suspicious about and it is quite nice that Mia and Lana can be friends, especially after everything that's happened. I would have rathered Lana own up to her mistakes for being so awful to Mia for such a long time and actually like apologize head on rather than just like becoming friends because I think, you know, that much trauma and that much bullying for so long should be addressed. At the same time, I'm just really glad that Mia and Lana can just move on from all of that also, and that is really healthy too. But I think the thing I love most about book nine is that we have a bit of a royal mystery. So Mia finds out about an ancestor who uh, was also a teenage girl, and she became queen of Genovia, but for about 12 days before she died of the plague. Oh, she also had a journal, so it's almost like a, a reflection of Mia from like hundreds of years ago. I think it was about 400 years before. So Mia sees a lot of herself in her, and Mia wants to read her journal and stuff like that. And there is like this mystery thing because her ancestor mentioned something about this document that was witnessed and signed, but this document's been lost and nobody knows what it is. So Mia ends up finding it because I love this whole like royal mystery angle of it. I love it when it's tied to Genovia. But this document, oh my god, it's, oh, it's huge. It's like a big bombshell. And Mia discovers it. And essentially her ancestor wanted to make Genovia a democracy and not to be like just singly ruled by the monarchy, by, you know, the Genovian royal family. So, you know, Mia, her dad, her grandmother, so that it would be a democracy and not just them ruling the country. And so Mia finds this document. She's like, well, this is amazing. That means they can elect a prime minister and the Genovian people can vote and have more control over their country. Like that would be amazing. But when Mia shows her dad and her grandmother it, they like freak out. They don't want that to ever come out. But then Mia does give a speech at the Women's Society ball thing. And obviously she can't take it back because it's in the papers. And now Genovia is gonna be a democracy, which obviously gets Mia into trouble, but she did what was right, which I honestly loved so much. Mia did the right thing. And that is probably the height of Mia's selflessness because she is putting the people of Genovia before her own family, which, you know, kind of some of it is a little bit questioned in book 10, but I think for now you can really respect and admire Mia for being so passionate about her people and how she's finally come to accept her role as a princess. Even though she is like trying to be like, oh, I don't want all of this princess duties, oh, he has an out kind of thing. Some of that is tied into it, but given Genovia the option of who rules the country, is like a really big step and a really big thing. So I love that. And it also added some drama. And you know, may I love some drama. So I would have given this book four stars. It is my favorite one of the series because of all of these little things and threads that came together. And yeah, I thought it was really good. Good progress, Mia, good progress. Bad progress, Mia, bad progress. So the final book that I'm gonna say is the final book, I'm gonna ignore book 11 and 12. Book 10, is the grand finale of the original series. There is a huge time skip in this one. So book nine, it was September. So pretty much the start of Mia's junior year. And then book 10, we skip all the way to the end of April, the year after when Mia is a senior and she has her 18th birthday coming up. She has her finals coming up, her senior prom coming up. So yeah, again, it's a huge, 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 time skip again. And I guess it works for this because Mia's dad is running for Prime Minister in Genovia, so all of that is pretty important for all of the things that were supposed to happen uh, during that time and how Genovia is changing as a democracy. So I totally get that. We also have this running element that Mia has written a novel and she's submitting it anonymously to different publishing houses. She gets a lot of rejections. Okay, so her novel is called Ransom My Heart. It was her senior project and she lied to everyone. She said it was about Genovia's oil, but it turns out to be a romance novel. She says it's not about her life, but it is historical romance and it sounds a little bit like Mia and Michael a little bit. And we do get excerpts of it. And you know what? I've been critical of Mia's creative writing earlier on, especially her poems, which have been shit. But actually, 
the excerpts of her novel isn't too bad. Like, I actually think she did a pretty good job with it. So again, like, Mia has come a long way, and I think she has gotten better with her creative writing skills. So good job, Mia. The only thing I find so unbelievable is that even though she gets a lot of rejections from these publishing houses, which she did submit under a pseudonym, she gets a call from an agent who says, I want to represent you. Well, actually not an agent, it was a publishing house. So she doesn't even go the agent route. She goes straight to a publisher. And this publisher person says, we want to publish it, but we need to know your real name. And so she tells her the real name, that's Mia Thermopolis, Princess of Genovia. But it was actually kind of good that Mia didn't use her name to get published because yeah, that would have been bad and it would have meant that she was only getting published because of her name and not because she was actually good. But getting a call under a pseudonym is great for her because it assures her that it was actually good. But I find it unbelievable that she has just turned 18, she has written this romance novel and it's getting published by a publishing house like straight away pretty much, you know what I mean? Like, I know she got a few rejections, but come on. I know it's harder than that to get published. And she didn't even use her princess card. And what was great is how it kind of juxtaposed her applying for universities. So at the start of this, she gets accepted into everywhere she goes for university, even though she knows her grades are not great. So she assumes that because she is Princess of Genovia that she got into all of these places without merit. So I love how both of those things clash with one another. You know, she gets rejected from so many publishing houses under a pseudonym, but she gets accepted into all these universities with her real name. So I kind of really do enjoy that theme. Mia also doesn't tell anyone that she got into. She doesn't want anyone to feel bad about any of that. So I find that kind of selfless as well. I mean, she is lying to a lot of people, but you know, she has best intentions and she doesn't want to upset anyone. And she has like a lot going on at the minute, you know, her finals, prom, her birthday. But speaking of prom, I thought we were gonna get a rehash of book five. You know how Mia was so obsessed with Michael asking her to prom and she wouldn't shut up about it. And I was so annoyed. It's like one of the worst books ever. Well, in this one, she starts off by saying, yeah, JP hasn't asked me to prom yet. And I was like, oh shit, yeah, we go again. It's gonna be a rehash in a book five. But actually Mia says, I understand JP is really busy. You know, he also has finals. He's doing this play and you know, like she's totally understandable. She isn't hounding him about asking her to prom. In fact, she doesn't even know if she wants to go to prom. She's kind of starting to sound like Michael in this book. Like, oh, you know, prom is lame. I don't want to go to prom. But it did show some growth with Mia because she didn't harp on about not being asked to prom, which was fantastic. There is a conversation between Mia and JP that leads to JP asking Mia at her 18th birthday party, which is in front of so many celebrities. For some reason, Donald Trump, who is always invited to these parties, I'm like, why? He's invited, a lot of celebrities are invited to this yacht party for Mia's birthday. And JP asks in front of everyone with a promise ring. So people assume that they've just gotten engaged. But he asks her to prom and Mia's like, well, we'll see. <laughs> Instead of just being honest with JP, she kind of makes things a little bit worse, which is part of the appeal with the teenage hijinks she gets up to. So again, I'm not being too critical of that. I guess the thing I am being the most critical of is that Michael comes back in this book and he's really successful now. He's got the surgical arm thing and Mia's grandmother, Queen Clarice, is asking Mia to ask Michael for one of these arm thingies for Genovia so that her dad has an advantage in the campaign to make him prime minister because Prince René is running against Mia's dad. So they're trying to get some kind of advantage. Mia is like so torn about that because she does want the best for the Genovian people, but she also doesn't really want to come face to face with Michael. You know, she hasn't seen him since he left for Japan. And she didn't even know he was in Manhattan again until she read it in a paper. So like she's very conflicted right now. She's still on shaky grounds with Lily at the minute too, but she does end up saying Michael, she goes for coffee with him. Meg, the author, is trying to romanticize this really inappropriate relationship between Mia and Michael. And yes, I know Mia is of age now, but the fact that somebody knew her as a child and now she's of age, that's just okay. I still don't think so. I still think this relationship is problematic and shouldn't exist. But the way that Tina herself as well says that it's romantic, and apparently we found out that Michael the entire time hired Boris to spy on Mia the entire time he was away in Japan. And again, that to me is creepy. But Tina is saying how, how romantic that is, that he spied on you this entire time, you know, while you were underage and now you're of age. Oh my God, it's all okay now because you're, well, 18 now. It's your birthday, now you're 18. Like, it doesn't matter. That's the police right now coming to arrest Michael. And now Mia is questioning her relationship with JP because Michael is back. And I don't think the relationship between JP and Mia, especially the way it's portrayed in this book, 
is healthy either because JP did dump Lily for her and wait until she was available and he has been calling the paparazzi so that they can spot them out and about so he's very Josh from book one. He's kind of had a bit of a character assassination in this even though I did find him quite sketchy in book nine there were some things he said that I found a bit suspect and he's proven it right in this book so like, it hasn't come out of nowhere the way that he just well firstly he isn't supportive of Mia when she says she's written a romance novel. He looks down on her and it's so heartbreaking for Mia because she's put her heart and soul into it. But he's like very dismissive and he isn't as supportive as he has been in the past. So it's a bit weird, but also it hasn't really come out of nowhere. We can tell that Meg is forcing JP to almost change character and be rather unsupportive and weird about everything so that Mia can get back with Michael. Because there's also another thing about JP not asking me to the prom, but he somehow had this hotel room booked that was booked for months, like at least months, for this place to have a room available for them. So like, obviously JP has been doing some sketchy things. So I guess it isn't really just because Michael came, but you can tell the author is like forcing that kind of narrative. And I can understand where Mia's coming from. She's torn. She's torn between two people. Michael is super successful now and all this and the other. It doesn't help that Mia and Michael keep meeting up and they go to Central Park and they have this horse and buggy ride. And then they start kissing on this buggy ride for 20 bucks. And there's even some under the neck action as well, apparently. But Mia says that she doesn't think that's cheating. If kissing counts as cheating, well, technically I really don't think it does, especially if it's with your ex. We won't get into the below the neck fondling part. So like she doesn't think she's cheated on JP, even though she absolutely did. And then she ends up breaking up with him when she finds out that JP has been calling the paparazzi. The play that JP wrote was about her. So she's got like the cease and desist letter thing about it, which I was approving of. But like, I didn't love the fact that she's been with JP for like nearly two years now, right? She said, I love you to him every single day. And now like, she's just dumped him at prom which, you know, he kind of deserved. He wasn't honest with her at all. Dumped him and she instantly got with Michael. And it's kind of implied that she lost her virginity to Michael after that. But again, I'm just like, ugh. but you know what? If we can just cut out the last part of this book, I would be so much happier because I'm telling you now, it would be so much better if we just didn't have all of this Michael stuff. I mean, yes, break up with JP. Be by yourself. I do not want any of this crap at the end of this book because it is absolutely vile and disgusting and I don't like it and I'm definitely not reading any more from this author so so the end of this book doesn't actually exist anymore to me it's cut out my life now this book is so much shorter also this book didn't need to be as long as it was like come on it was the longest one at like nearly 400 pages what was the need what was the point ah crap i accidentally cut out a bit about lily and mia as well so yeah i hate the fact that mia and michael got back together that shouldn't have happened but also lily and mia become friends again not just like the whole civil because they were talking but not talking in a way like they do become friends again lily helped with a campaign for genovia without like saying anything and she did it out of the goodness of her heart apparently turns out that michael had asked her to be nice to mia so really like lily the way she acts in this book was only because michael told her to but then we find out that she hold this grudge against mia because she got with jp right after jp broke her heart and that's not what good friends should do but again lily never listened to a word mia said she didn't even give mia a chance to explain herself and it was just huge misunderstandings between both of them. They both agree that they needed to apologize. They don't actually apologize to one another, which again, I think Lily should absolutely apologize for what she did to Mia, making the hate website and stuff like that. Again, like I'm kind of glad that we're burying the hatchet there. Mia is happy and stuff, that's great. But where was all of the whole female empowerment? Where is the, I need to find out who I am without a man, Mia from book nine? Ugh, I'm just fed up. <laughs> because we could have had a good thing. We had all that progress with Mia, owning the fact that she is a princess now and the good that can do to her ugh, regressing in some points and making progress in other points in her life. Oh, uh, also my birthday is May 7th and the entire original 10 book series ends on May 7th. So I guess that's a birthday present to myself. The fact that this series ends on my birthday. Love that. And there is a good message about friendship at the end too. I might need to grab the part that I dropped, hang on. I need to grab the part that I cut out, two seconds. Friends like that are more precious than all the tiaras in the world. 
And like, yes, friendship is definitely important. Definitely above, you know, becoming a princess and all this, that, and the other. But really what it boils down to is that Mia never really had any good influences around her. Her friends were awful, all of them, including Tina, by the end of it. The boyfriends she ended up getting with, awful and illegal. Her family, awful as well. So like, it's hard, isn't it? It's so hard, but it was honestly an experience too. A lot of those themes that are explored to do with teenage life, I think could be beneficial in a lot of ways, but the romanticizing of abusing a minor is not the best message. And I really do hope that anybody who gives this to a teenager to read, to anyone who still thinks that Mia is awful over Michael, that you kind of reevaluate and look at it from the perspective of somebody who was a minor and see it from their point of view. And also see it from the point of view of the law. If I was reading the Princess Diaries books, two stars. So the last two books, The Princess Diaries Wedding and Quarantine Princess Diaries, I'm not gonna read this because I'm not gonna read Mia marrying Michael, her groomer. In this one, The Quarantine Princess Diaries started off on Meg's blog and wasn't originally intended to be a novel. And I've read reviews online. A lot of people say it's terrible, shouldn't have happened. I'm not even gonna give this one a chance. And especially since a lot of people say that, how come she is now an adult, but she is still acting like her teenage self? So it sounds like a lot of development and a lot of lessons learned from the original series has not carried over into the new books. And I'm sorry if I've let you down because I'm not reading these, but I cannot do this to myself. I cannot approve of the end game relationship. Do look up online about these yourself if you wanna know more about them. I'm not gonna put myself through that. So that is the original 10 books read for this vlog. So that is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. Don't forget to leave this video a like if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave all your comments down below, let me know what you thought of the video. Have you read the Princess Diaries books yourself? Do you love them? Do you hate them? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Just tell me everything down below. I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons and my One Piece channel members for supporting my channel. If you'd like to join my Patreon or my One Piece channel membership, then all the links are down in the description box. But yeah, I hope I will see you in the next video. Bye. Thank you for being here today. <laughs>